But I think we're ready to start with the first session. So the, the, the structure is going to be the following. Um, so the participant is in, in the first block, uh, there will be four people are going to ask the questions and give their inter interventions. And I think that we're going to then make an effort to think together, just because the author is not here, the author is absent. Um, so in this first block, we'll have Rastko Mochnik, Valida Repovac-Nikšić, Natasha Sarjoska, and Vedran Džehić. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, my topic is um, a rereading of the book, um, a rereading of the book uh, from uh, our contemporary situation. Um, I should only um, uh, comment on this wonderful work that was uh, done by uh, uh, by uh, colleague uh, Tri Trajkovic and uh, Ivkovic. Uh, they made a, a, a fantastic effort and the result is brilliant about the reception of this book. I would also only comment that uh, they very well catched the um, uh, institutionalized uh, Mm, science uh, in the ex uh, post Yugoslav or Yugoslav uh, space, uh, while um, uh, in uh, uh, in Slovenia this book came in an uh, in an unlucky moment uh, when the non uh, institutionalized, uh, which is, was the most relevant uh, theoretical effort. Uh, has already started to uh, receive uh, Wallerstein's uh, World uh, System Theory. So this book was a kind of simplification of what was uh, uh, more precisely read in other uh, Wallerstein's works, while Balibar was already shifting uh, towards post-Marxism uh, in a moment when in Slovenia the, the trend was just the opposite, back to Marxism, to the hardcore um, economically based Marxism. So it came into a void. And uh, as you rightly <laughs> stressed, it was only postmodernist circles that <laughs> kind of read this book. Um, Okay, so my uh, my topic is uh, the theoretical relevance of this uh, uh, of this book for this moment, um, our present moment here in uh, in periphery of Europe. Uh, the two authors have very lucidly um, diagnosed two processes that uh, only later uh, became evident and um, our daily occupation. Namely, one which um, which comes from the 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 the, the, gr the most uh, general structural structural division into into center and periphery, core and periphery, uh, and which uh, they treat under the rubric of racism, and the other process. Uh, which is uh, based on structural pressures upon the elementary, elementary unit of reproduction, namely the household. And uh, here, uh, Wallerstein uh, situates formation of ethnicity and culturalization of uh, social, uh, social relations, namely uh, uh, households under pressure, under structural pressure, uh, respond by mobilizing tr so-called traditional or uh, mechanisms at hand, which are kinship, ethnicity, and religion. And we, uh, we get a pseudo-traditionalist, but actually very modern or contemporary uh, construction of ethnicity as a supplementary uh, uh, social network, supplementary social solidarity, when the pressures become too, too strong. Now, Wallerstein, uh, um, Wallerstein uh, introduces a very simple, but also very productive scheme about uh, the phenomena of race 
nation and ethnic group, linking them to three different uh, structural uh, levels of the world system. The center-periphery division of labor uh, is linked to racism. The inter-state system uh, within the world capitalism has the, uh, the intention to secure participation uh, in the overall produced surplus value, globally produced surplus value, to local, to local uh, ruling classes, uh, which is the raison d'etre of uh, the states within the world system. And nationalism for Wallerstein is ideology that goes, uh, that uh, is the organic ideology of nation states. Now, the most interesting and the best elaborated uh, level uh, by Wallerstein is the lowest level, the level of the unit of reproduction, the household. And he speaks about, um, about the, um, ha the household and the formation of ethnicity as um, dependent upon specific ways how different types of households in different locations in the world integrate into the world labor power. So this Wollaston scheme is simple, it's even simplistic, but it's a very good start. It's also um, 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 mechanistic, so, but it opens space uh, for a further theoretical elaboration. Uh, now, of course, within this, um, within this um, uh, elementary construction, the nation and nationalism have a strategic position. It's the middle level, uh, which, um, which uh, Wallerstein actually treats very economistically as uh, nation states being mechanisms of recuperation of surplus value uh, by local elites, by local ruling classes, which are different types of bourgeoisie usually, but also uh, rent, uh, uh, rent uh, um, taking uh, landlords, etc. So, uh, the problem with the nation is left uh, at this stage by Wallerstein, uh, it's economically, it's economically um, explained, but what, what, what lacks is precisely the, the very problem of, of nation, which means what is the socio-etatistic um, or socio-juridical uh, construction which enables um, a state to perform its class uh, economic uh, uh, function. And here Balibar comes in. Uh, Balibar starts with racism, but basically his um, uh, grand preoccupation is the nation. Uh, he, uh, his first gambit, his first move is to unite what Wallerstein has conceptually separated. So uh, he, Balibar creates a philosophical construction uh, and calls it uh, uh, fictive ethnicity. Nation is fictive ethnicity. So now he has liquidated the gains uh, produced by Wallerstein and he has to, to, uh, to enter into um, a whole, to, to construe a whole new construction that would uh, justify this, uh, this move uh, away from Wallerstein. And he, he, carries, he goes on, Bali Bar goes on, well, nation is a fictive ethnicity uh, uh, produced by, uh, by two, main, uh, two main mechanisms. One is standardized language and the other is race. Now, standardized language is a synchronical mechanism and race is a pseudo-diachronical uh, mechanism, a mechanism that uh, uh, co uh, construes a pseudo-diachronical continuity through time. 
And uh, the language is too, is uh, actually too eff efficacious. It's, uh, it's, uh, the language is too um, integrative. Uh, people learn languages, and uh, the mother tongue is a relative, uh, is a relative category. So people learn too fast for the discrimination needed for the construction of nation. And here, here, race comes in with the idea, Balibar's idea, that race is a necessary supplement uh, to the nation. Nations na organically or logically tend towards racism. So this is a, I mean, this is kind of Derridean thesis, philosophical, but it's productive. Only that Balibar doesn't ask two questions. He doesn't ask the question why the nation needs supplementation. What kind of structure or mechanism the nation is to need to be supplemented by something else. He gives kind of, you know, amateurish linguistic uh, arguments about language being uh, too integrative, second generations learn language and their mother tongue is already, etc. These are empirical arguments, a good starting point for theory, but Ibar doesn't elaborate. So because he doesn't ask the question, what is such in a nation that it needs supplementation, he cannot ask another, even more important question, is the racism the only way to supplement nationality? Is, is, uh, do alternative ways, other type of uh, supplementation exist? And evidently they do. The whole 20th century is the century of national liberation movements mostly inspired by October Revolution, by socialist idea, which means overdetermined or supplemented, as Balibar would say, by socialism. And you can see what happens if national liberation is not supplemented by, by, by socialism in Turkey. You know, it's 100 years from Turkish Revolution, and still they pay this tax upon uh, uh, the shortcomings of, of, uh, of uh, Ataturk's uh, nationalist uh, revolution. So, uh, so here, here, Balibar misses uh, a very uh, important point. Uh, basically, for me, for, for he, for, uh, he introduces an ethnocentric West, Western European, uh, Western European uh, um, uh, uh, um, the theory of nation, which applies uh, uh, to, to core Western European countries that never had a socialist revolution and were mostly imperialist countries that, that didn't need a nationalist revolution. <laughs> so, so that's that's a great, a great, a great, uh, a great um, uh, um, failure, and uh, and. Uh, Baribar pays this theoretical inconsistency by kind of spontaneously elaborating a theory of nation molded about a theory of ethnicity, which means that he is cult culturalizing uh, the nation and uh, uh, missing completely the economic point which was already uh, offered by Wallerstein. Now, I guess this is the, uh, the, the, the objective reason for this um, uh, Balibar's uh, lack, theoretical lack, uh, that there are two, uh, two objective reasons. One was that the process of depolitization, culturalization, ident uh, identity form formation was already objectively under the way in the late, uh, in, during the 80s. That's one point. The second point is theoretical regression, uh, we, which we call postmodernism which was called more, uh, uh, you know, it started like Nouvelle Histoire in France, uh, cultural turn in the United States, uh, cultural studies, second phase, not uh, the first phase, in Great Britain. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, finish with two indications. Um, the problem uh, uh, 
um, of the um, uh, state economy articulation that's evident in uh, in uh, in uh, in Balibar um, comes to its uh, to its uh, critical point in his theory of class. He wants to dissolve class into uh, a struggle between uh, among identitary groups. Uh, that's his, his uh, contribution: class struggle without classes, uh, uh, classless struggle. So um, he uh, uh, he kind of uh, um, dissolves uh, this uh, problematics um, by uh, by supplementing classes uh, 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 by uh, identity groups. Now. Um, this uh, operation, uh, I, will, I will only, because it's so interesting, so interesting. It's very difficult, you know, to fight against the class. So, uh, he, inter first inter he first notices an oscillation in Marx between economistic concept of class and political concept of class. Now, for Marx, there is no distinction between the two. It's artificially introduced. And of course, he then can say it oscillates. Now, let me let me finish. Um, if Belibar uh, had read Wallerstein, and if he had later read Mamardashvili, and if he had read Operaists, not Negri, which is the decadent phase, but the, the, those who were working in the factories and making sociology out of everyday experience of class fights in of, of the place, uh, he could overcome something that is already evident as a lack in uh, um, uh, Lear Le Capital. Uh, the equipe, the team who, uh, who, who, who read Capital had great difficulties to read the third volume. Ranciere tried and failed, and the only one who succeeded was Estable, whom Althusser kicked out of the volume, of the, uh, in the short, in the short uh, uh, publication of this work. So the sins, theoretical sins, have a long arm and come after you. <laughs> Thank you. So the next one is Valida. Uh, thank you. Uh, my intervention is uh, a little bit different. It's really from the perspective, uh, uh, current perspective, from 2017, and it is uh, read. Uh, the, I read the book uh, in dialogue uh, with authors that I um, read within this new cosmopolitanism theory, and here I will shortly. Uh, present these theories because I think that it is really important to 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 have um, to have this dialogue and maybe to have this reflection 30 years after especially with uh, with the current problem and recent problem of um, migration that we have in Europe and this hostile answer to the people coming um, and fleeing uh, the parts of the world that are, that are today defined by tragedies. So um, my uh, working title was The New Cosmopolitanism as a Response of a Global Citizen to Brutal Globalization. And um, in the subtitle, I would add with a special focus on my migration crisis today. Uh, the times that follow the fall of communism and the end of the Cold War, although promising to be different due to various positive effects of globalization, actually added further complexity to reality and relationships. This is most apparent in the fields of economy, culture, politics and neoliberal ideology. 
Social science and politics are dominated by liberal rhetoric of universalism, tolerance, human rights, but the practice is completely different. We witness atomization, alienation, inequality and poverty that generate ethnic nationalism, post-colonial, post-socialist, inter-religious conflicts, intolerance, wars, new imperial wars, wars, 21st century walls, as Wendy Brown put it, that countries build around themselves, revolutions, terrorism, racism, neo-fascism. On the other hand, contemporary society is characterized by development of new technologies and communications and generally greater mobility, all of which positively impact our lives. Still, greater mobility and easier networking, regardless of physical distance, is accompanied by the solution of closed and fixed identities and by interpersonal relationships that are superficial, sporadic and short-lived. Globalization has now reached the point of no return. We are all dependent on each other and the only choice we have is between mutually assuring each other's vulnerability and mutually assuring our shared security. Bluntly, to swim together or to sink together. I believe that for the first time in human history, everybody's self-interests and ethical principles of mutual respect and care point in the same direction and demand the same strategy. From a curse, globalization may yet turn into a blessing. Humanity <coughs> never had better chance, wrote Zygmunt Bauman. Today's intellectuals therefore have a major responsibility to contemplate this society, this integrated, disintegrated phenomenon that survives on its inherent ambivalence and paradoxes. This world vulnerability calls for finding a path, a way out, to a safe and peaceful world. In understanding the world as it is in all its complexity, the current social and political thought, predominantly critical and left-oriented, rightly ask whether now, at the start of the 21st century, we are even further removed from the Kantian ideal of eternal peace or on the path towards overcoming antagonisms and evil. This intervention allows for identification of cosmopolitan theory as a possible answer con to contemporary world problems. The last migrant crisis provoked a negative reaction from the civilized European hosts. Once again, civilized. Once again, people face problems as old as the world we live in, fear and rejection of those who are different, foreign, unknown. This situation, in addition to presenting politicians with challenges, brought back a dilemma known since ancient Greek philosophy, that of hospitality to a stranger. Searching for an answer on how to avoid this new emergence of xenophobia, fascism and new racism in the host stranger dialectic, many authors offer a cosmopolitan perspective. Even without the recent wave of migrants, this issue resurfaced in social and political theory in the early 1990s in response to the need to address modern globalization phenomena. Many thinkers reached for the ancient Greek concept of cosmopolitanism, modified it to fit contemporary circumstances and named it new cosmopolitanism. Some of them are Sila Ben Habib, Kwame Antonia Paya, Ulrich Beck, Wendy Brown, Zygmunt Bauman, Paul Gilroy, and many others. The contemporary definition describes cosmopolitanism as a way of being in the globalized world. Most authors define cosmopolitanism as an appropriate and dignified approach to other, different, or more generally as tolerance of ethnic, cultural, national, political, and other differences. The description of the term leads to a conclusion that cosmopolitanism is a concept laden with dichotomy, or dichotomy, particular form of tension that advocates respect for difference and singularity, as well as for equality sameness. Furthermore, cosmopolitanism is often presented as a utopian concept. 
the utopia being the belief that it can become a part of social and political practice, although, according to the source, today's megapolises such as London, New York, Paris, Istanbul embody many elements and values of these ideas. As Ulrich Beck wrote, we can live the cosmopolitan condition today. We just need to become aware, according to him, cosmopolitanism of the second modernity became an undeniable part of daily life, something concealed that crept on its own into lives and reality. He calls this sociological phenomenon banal cosmopolitanism and uses it to prove that the present is becoming cosmopolitan. Banal cosmopolitanism is a feature of the ever-growing unconscious interdependence. However, although this type of cosmopolitanism exists in all pores of social and political life, sociological imagination remains quite restricted within the boundaries of local, national, known, safe. Beck makes a distinction between philosophy and sociology, which he considers practice, between cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitanism of reality. New cosmopolitanism is not something just for intellectual elites and opinions. Today, we have a globalized, highly technologically developed urbanized and individualized society which suffers the plagues of nationalism, xenophobia, fascism and new racism. It is obvious that global tendencies based on the neoliberal ideology have created the insecurity of modern day life and the permanent presence of fear. Uncertain future is further reflected in distrust among people, particularly towards those we do not know. Bauman writes that refugees and migrants are the messengers of the fragility of our lives. Since we are powerless against the powers of globalization, if nothing else, we can turn this anger and resentment against them. The same fear of cheap labor, for example, is felt by both the precariat and the wealthiest, and this lack of trust between people is an indicator of the current crisis of mankind. Politicians were the ones that have the biggest benefits from the complexity of the current situation, as they saw their chance in populist rhetoric based on the fear of arrival of barbarians. This charmed circle, as Wendy Brown calls it, of fear of migration, securitization of borders, terrorist groups, where, as this author notes, migrants are generally equated to terrorists, produces an ongoing state of emergency. The threat is not just to the state, but also its subjects, citizens. In these politicians, in these politicians are deliberately hiding other, more significant threats. They are concealing the fact that the global market is so deregulated that the regulation of labor market and increased labor flexibility contributes to fragile social positions and unstable identity, further generating an intense feeling of existential insecurity. Populist leaders and their governments profit from the uncertain future of their citizens, while fight against terrorism serves to legitimize their power and return self-respect to the nation. Bauman insists that the only way out of this situation is to establish direct communication between hosts and migrants in order to create mutual understanding, to establish the dialogue. The solution is to accept rather than reject and find guilty in the absence of a crime. Social exclusion is the main source of radicalization. The, the solution is therefore in social investment, social inclusion and integration globally. The solution lies in Gadamer's fusion of horizons or a pious cosmopolitan world of dialogue. It is therefore necessary to return to the path to eternal peace in which Kant introduces the new concept of cosmopolitan law by making it a third sphere of public law, supplementing constitutional state and international law in order to secure and guarantee the rights of individual citizens as well as states. Cosmopolitan law, the right to hospitality, a concept extensively studied by the author Sila Ben Habib II. 
At the end, the sharpest critique of new cosmopolitanism is Paul Gilroy, who believes that cosmopolitanism, manipulated by nationalistic ideas and instrumentalized for the purposes of colonial conquest and neo-colonial conquest and economic exploitation, failed to be what, is, what it is essentially is or what it should promote, coexistence of differences, planetary wealth, right to be human. Unfortunately, economic cosmopolitanism followed by political and cultural cosmopolitanism instead gave birth to the new racial relationships. Cosmopolitanism was modified and for most inhabitants of planet Earth, especially the marginalized ones, became opposed cosmopolitanism. Imperial politics of mighty Western countries abused to it abuse it to civilize hostile foreigners and others. Therefore, the idea of a spontaneous culture of coexistence is the most realistic one. This idea actually involves cohabitation and interaction processes which contribute to multiculturalism becoming the norm of daily social life, particularly in large urban centers around the world. Through cosmopolitan coexistence, Gilroy tries to save both multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism and also to warn of the disease of new racism. He thinks that the first step is to reject the category of identity in general as a central concept in social and political theories, as it has proven to be a dangerous approach in analyzing and understanding race, ethnicity, nation politics. Cosmopolitan coexistence, mobility, development of technology and communications, generally globalization as radical openness contribute on a daily basis to the absurdity of existence of closed, fixed, embodied identities. Thank you. Thank you. Natasha. Mine is a more of a reflection rather than a classical intervention. Um, I will first um, introduce what this, because this is how I understood what this book means for me. I discovered this book not uh, in my native country, but thanks to my PhD supervisor in Germany, uh, Reinhard Jula, uh, in, in the University of Tübingen, where I have uh, uh, written my PhD on the dissolution of the former Yugoslavian borders and how those uh, borders were perceived, uh, lived, uh, survived and interpreted in the artwork, in the migration artwork of uh, mainly female artists, uh, namely Slavenka Draculic, but my main focus was Tanja Ostojic, a Serbian artist who uh, illegally crossed borders um, to join um, her own art exhibition in Graz and this uh, artistic precedent of abolition of the perception of uh, border uh, took me to um, understand empirically the importance of this book especially the chapter which is not maybe written uh, not written by Balibar but by uh, Valer Steen, the production of people so uh, I will, uh, this is how I perceive this book in my doctoral research, but in order not to repeat myself, because it's almost, I think, three years since I did my PhD, and since I'm coming from, um, uh, let's say, a freshly uh, invented or new country named Macedonia, uh, I would like to draw on uh, two notions of, um, of this book, the produc production of people and the production and the crisis of nation, also for personal reasons, and I invite you maybe to a larger uh, reflection, because since I, since my, since my youth, since I'm 14 years old, I'm constantly invited to define myself, to define my language, my belonging, my nationality, and even to change, to change my name, my last name. So this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, political uh, uh, context uh, creates some sort of ontological anxiety and uncertainty that brought me to a larger extent to think about what this production of people means. Um, and uh, in that sense, it, as Professor Mochnik as well said, it, it, we cannot neglect this vital concept that define nation, and that is the concept of, of language, but as well the concept of, um, of political affiliation and political belonging. And here I, I refer to 
the concept of transnational citizenship uh, coined by Balibar when he is referring to the Italian uh, philosopher Carlo Galli, who is um, arguing this ambiguity, uh, ambiguity of of the notion of of frontier, not not merely border, but frontier, inner frontier, in which we have to define our existence and and define our also individual and public demarcation. Um, the social formation is produced as nation to the extent where the individual is constituted as homo nationalis, says Wallerstein, from birth to death through a specific network of um, devices and everyday practices. And this then in this chapter brings Wallerstein to the question of, of uh, the creation, establishment of a community, even though these two notions are notions that personally I avoid to use, but since this book is in this book they're relevant, and this notion of uh, identity, um, which is as a uh, which are put also in a, in a context of fictional identity and fictional ethnicity. And here I will just shortly read a, a quote, um, firstly in French, then I will translate it uh, by Wallerstein. Tout identité individuelle, mais il n'y a jamais d'identité individuelle qu'historique, c'est-à-dire construite dans un champ de valeurs sociales, de normes et comportements de symboles collectifs. That is to say that this identity that they both speak about are very individual, but it cannot be individual if it's not historic. That is to say, built in a field of social values, norms, and behaviors, and collective symbols. So this novelty introduced by Balibar is that actually, in the historical sense, that not no real communities, but every community, even those that we perceive as real, are imaginary, and they are very relevant, especially for this geopolitical, geographical space of former Yugoslavia, because as he says, they are reproduced by the international functioning, and I quote, by the projection of the individual existence in the network of these collective narratives. Furthermore, and always in the line with what Weber and Gramsci said, Wallerstein says that people cannot exist naturally. And this is a big, uh, con I mean, exciting, overwhelming contradiction. Even, he says, when they are tendentionally produced, they cannot exist once for always, because there is no modern nation state that possess an ethnical basis. And here comes the question of these mobile, shifting, blurred, liminal, and liquid spaces, which are fermenting in the ambivalence and vulnerability of the nationhood building project, even though I'm not expert, uh, 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 luckily, of the Macedonian question. But uh, here I draw the case of, of Macedonia, because it's a very interesting, even though small political uh, space, a new, uh, I mean, independent country, which is very much fermenting because it is um, a political uh, uh, space which is in continuous conflict uh, with the neighbors and con continuous definition of its own uh, belonging. And where we have uh, recently, in the past few years, we have witnessed a flagrant. Uh, rebirth and recreation of national <coughs> communities. Here when I speak of national community, I also refer to the Albanian component of the Macedonian state. And, uh, and those, uh, uh, this recreation, and to put it in Eric Hobsbawm terms, this reinvention of the past has went to, to flagrant practices of hallucinations and euphoria, collective euphoria, uh, total uh, erasure of past, erasure of memory, um, extreme um, uh, usurpation of public space and violence of, of inner boundary in the sense of building uh, uh, monuments uh, that reproduce some uh, uh, imaginary fictional Albanian uh, uh, reappropriation of this space or Macedonian who claim uh, belonging to antiquity. And this becomes a sort of a, so to say, Disneyland or a fairy tale which uh, to, to this extent tends to recreate uh, uh, from the public space to recreate, um, to, here I refer again to Carlo Galli, to this politi pub, uh, political space which should constitute a, a, a new nation, a new na nationhood. 
And uh, here I, I draw this uh, discussion to a larger uh, uh, question raised by Balibar about, uh, and you also, uh, I think Jurja mentioned this, the, the crisis, because Dali, uh, Balibar uh, recently um, argued a lot about the crisis of Europe, and you mentioned also the Balkanization. So this uh, sort of fragmentation of political space and fragmentation of, of public space puts a correlation between the question is creation of political space related to production of people, and how can the notion of transnational citizenship can be transposed in these small, new, uh, uh, arose countries, given the fact that, as Balibar says, you, uh, the, the crisis in Europe is flagrant and is putting into question the, the existence of these political spaces, because Balibar said that Europe, I quote, Europe cannot exist. Uh, he, he said this in a lecture, I think, in the University of Niemingen in 2011. Europe cannot exist if it does not configure this political space. And here I will quote Carlo Galli, who defines this um, political space. Quote, globalization requires a convenient political space which is not itself global, and in order to fully develop its de uh, dynamic potential. To put it shortly, if one wants to avoid at the same time the reaction, uh, reactionary reactions to globalization, which try to preserve large or small communities, and the tragic nonsense of universalized alienation. Uh, I finished the quote. So the question is how to transpose this notion of transnational citizenship in these dissolving political former Yugoslavian spaces. Then another question that I, I raise is how individuals are naturally nationalized, that is to say socialized in this dominant form of national belonging, how specia spatia spatiality, how space can shape uh, this national belonging, and to end uh, my unfortunately short present reflection, I, 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 I again quote uh, Balibar, who quotes a very enigmatic idea uh, uh, given by Marx. He says that, uh, uh, he quotes Marx given uh, this, the, the idea that he gave about this historical sense of nation, saying that what connects social groups and individuals is not a superior common good, or rather a higher specific juridical order, but a conflict in continuous and perpetual development. Thank you. Thank you, and for the f end of the first block, we have Vedran Jihic at the end. Thank you. So this, this was perfect by Natasha. She, she said <laughs> she's, uh, her contribution was, was unfortunately short. This is quite interesting, and my, my contribution will be fortunately short. <laughs> this, this, this is I the way. Not modest. Yeah, well, not modest. Okay, fine. Uh, no, I mean, the, I, uh, probably Peta invited me to to play the role of of, of, of a political scientist in the round of, 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 of philosophers, and he always do, does the same, and then we have to argue afterwards. But in any case, so Rastko started with a very systematic uh, philosophical approach. Then Valida was a bit different, as he said at the beginning, and then Natasha providing rather reflection than intervention, but my reflection will be rather small interventions <laughs> than, than a big one. So, uh, however, uh, just a few few points, and this, uh, just I was reading the text and uh, I was focusing on the chapter four, construction of peoplehood, uh, and I, I, I just want to, to say what, what came into my mind. Uh, and it's not systematical, so uh, Rastko, we have probably to have a conversation how to improve my systematicity. Uh, but next time over coffee or Shlivovic. Uh So the, the first point was basically a, a very personal and, and, and painful question that I have been asking myself for, for, for the uh, majority of my uh, conscious life. Uh, and this is something that Wallerstein mentions at the beginning of his chapter four, uh, this so-called open-ended question, what, what are you? That, the, uh, uh, that we individuals always have to uh, answer. And basically asking the question, there is this scene at the chapter four uh, about s South African setting, uh, uh, basically asking the question, what is the correct label to us uh, people? As, as he quotes, people shoot each other every day over the question of labels. And my 
and, and then, then my, my whole story came into my mind. As a, my mother is Ukrainian, my father is a, is a, is a Bosnian Muslim, uh, a socialist, atheist, uh, something. Uh, then I came to Austria, they called me Austrian Bosnian a political scientist or Bosnian Austrian political scientist, whatever. Uh, but this kind of, uh, and this is very serious, this permanent labeling stands uh, at the beginning of the destruction of this very previous country that we are, we are sitting right now. So this is this is one of the of, 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 of major major points of observation and the destruction of my home uh, society, <laughs> Bosnian society, which is fragmented uh, and basically not exist uh, 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 today, uh, based on this permanent labeling that we have on a daily level, uh, is basically uh, a reminder uh, of what kind of violence uh, or intensity of violence sits just around the corner of this very building, just up there or up there, uh, and basically sits uh, at the corner of the global system. Uh, so uh, this is my, my, my first point. The second one is uh, thinking about the categories of racism, nationalism, ethnicity, what is striking, uh, looking at it from the perspective of, the, of 2017, is the stability and persistence uh, of, 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 of uh, racism, uh, nationalism, uh, both the ba banal one at the daily level as well as the institutionally entrenched one. Uh, as Valestines describes its nationalism as the expression, the promoter, and the consequence of state level uniformities, <laughs> or to borrow Rastko's uh, words, organic ideology of nation state, which is very persistent when we just uh, do uh, uh, go quickly back to, to 2015 and this clash between Serbia and Croatia. Uh, where basically all historical constructions uh, and, and, and notions uh, of, of race or nation, belonging, peoplehood, uh, just suddenly after a decade of Europeanization, regional stability, approximation, blah, 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 Europeanization, democratization, blah, blah, whatever, uh, uh, flooded the, the discussion immediately and brought us back uh, to the Stone Age uh, of, of the construction of the nation in the, in, the, in the region of former Yugoslavia. Or the same one, even more painful and, and, and deadly, deadly, because Praljak killed himself uh, just recently. Uh, the reactions at the, at, the, at the judgments at The Hague basically showed once again that, that uh, uh, the, 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 the myth that is built around our nation our people and race uh, is one that can even kill. Uh, even though the people first thought that he is drinking just a Shlivovic, but he was uh, he was seriously seriously crazy, or crazy uh, crazily serious. Uh, then the next the next point uh, is Manuela Boyajiev's point about uh, uh, she mentioned the rise of, of, of authoritarianism and demise of Europe. Uh, that was probably not. Uh, meant against the background of, 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 of the huge question looming over Europe, is Muti going to survive uh, or not to survive, but who knows, uh, at least she will be supported by Vucic. Uh, uh, the, no, but the, the, the serious point is basically the, the construction and the reconstruction of the people who are described by Palestine and, and, uh, is basically one of the major pillars of contemporary authoritarianism. Uh, 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 when we quote Ignatiev uh, from Central European University, he, a few years ago he thought there is a new chameleon which is authoritarian in politics and capitalist and neoliberal in economy. And the basic uh, feature of this new chameleon uh, is labeling, is othering that Valida described and, and you were referring to. Uh, and basically is the politics of fear. Uh, and there is this wonderful small, and it's not only small, but a, a good book that by Ruth Vodak, uh, 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 published recently uh, in, in Great Britain, uh, where she is focusing at something that, that needs to be a next step in our thinking, basically. Uh, she analyzes the normalization of nationalistic, xenophobic, racist, and anti-Semitic rhetoric in Europe, which builds the new framework for the politics of fear that is entrenching new social divides of nation, gender, and body. Uh, and this is once again alluding to some underlying structural phenomena behind Wallerstein's scheme that you mentioned, the three layers. Uh, so basically, this, this is what, what tells us where we have to look into uh, to reveal micro-politics of right-wing populism and racism uh, 
Uh, and as, as just today the new Austrian government uh, was introduced into power, uh, so Kurds, unfortunately we don't, I mean we don't communicate today in, in Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, it would be very nice to, to play with Kurds. Uh, but uh, uh, this is in English, so Kurds and Strache, they just, they just uh, uh, presented the, the program of the new Austrian government for the next five years, and this is basically paradigmatic for the for the for the for the for the situation in Europe right now. Uh, the new minister of interior is going to be Kickl, a guy called Kickl, uh, uh, and this Kickl uh, uh, became famous as a major mastermind be behind all racist and nationalist. Uh, paroles uh, in the last few years of Strache and Haida. One of them is Dahamstadt Islam. As Dahamstadt Islam means at home instead of Islam. Uh, and the another one, and this is, and this will lead to the complex of racism that, that Georgia mentioned. The another one was a, a, a harsh attack against the president of the of the of the Jewish community in Austria. And the president back then was Ariel Musikant. And and. This Kikl, the new Minister of Interior, uh, uh, this is probably going to come soon to, to Belgrade to visit Stefanovic and all the other guys. Uh, as, uh, he, he told in German, we can einer der Ariel heißt so viel Dreck am Stecken haben. Uh, how can someone who is called Ariel, as the washing pullover, uh, have skeletons in the closet or have so much dirt? And this is basically, this leads me immediately to the complex of racism, and I believe this is one of the, of the crucial paradigms. And this, uh, is why this book and the debates about this book should be not uh, only kept into the academic framework, but basically carried out uh, uh, to, to the broader public. Uh, and the, 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 the new complex of racism obviously is, is, is linked to the migration as a new defining moment of, of, of new Europe or, or after Europe as a guy that some of us don't like and some of us like, Ivan Krastev. Uh, usually tends to say, uh, but in any case, what we do have, uh, we have a return of racism with a friendly face. And 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 in, in just recently in the Guardian, someone said this is the rise of respectable racism, respectable racism. Uh, uh, and and basically, this how to deconstruct this respectable, uh, uh, decent uh, racism uh, might be uh, one of the theoretical questions that that Palestine and Baliba. Uh, might want to to answer at least uh, at least try to answer. So finally, to conclude, uh, and I was probably uh, hopefully shorter than Natasha. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I do believe, and this is where I simply there is this small booklet booklet by Timothy Snyder, Snyder uh, on tyranny, uh, and he draws like the historical comparison between the 30s and today, and he has like 20 advices what to do in order to 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 prevent the world from slipping into the the major disaster and and one of the like point 18 is read books and talk to people so like very simple read books and talk to people and i really do believe that rereading this this very book rereading this very book it should be finally translated into bosnian serbian creation uh, could be a task for the institute for philosophy and uh, theory. Uh, uh, basically, the uh, the the uh, rereading the book will will tell us today uh, uh, basically what is uh, what is at the at the core of of, of this uh, global return of racism and, and uh, as Kurt Strache, Kickel, and the others are representing it. Uh, and then finally, to end by by a quote by the end quote from the chapter four by Emmanuel Wallerstein. Uh, one puzzling question uh, and one task for the group for social engagement in here in Belgrade. Uh, and I'm quoting, we can never do away with peoplehood in this system or relegate it to a minor role. On the other hand, we must not be bemused by the virtues ascribed to it or we shall be betrayed by the ways in which it legitimized the existing system. What we need to analyze more closely are the possible directions in which, as peoplehood becomes even more central to this historical system, it is valid for 2017 also. It will push us as the system's bifurcation point towards various possible alternative outcomes in the uncertain process of the transition from our present historical system to the one or ones that will replace it. As we are in the middle of one, yet another transition to something, uh, to something new, probably in some kind of interregnum with morbid symptoms of all kinds, uh, I believe that this very book uh, and the group for social engagement, and, and what I like at the end of any kind of reflection, small intervention, I like to, qu to quote Adriana, 
uh, I have to uh, because I I promised her to 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 publish one small piece and I never 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 managed to but there will be a new book coming so this is a, uh, just an in internal information but basically uh, but the book and the debates around the book and and this is one of the tasks for Belgrade and for the region helps us uh, it might be the definition of the new utopian horizon for engagement uh, and 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 this has to be probably it has to be started from, from, from this very place. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. So because we, don't, we do not have an author here with us, um, one of the ways to go about this, if you, we, we will open the floor to a dialogue, discussion, and if you have interventions on each other's papers, that would be lovely, and even the, the audience will take some 15 minutes to discuss this and then move on to the second block. Yeah, I have a brief question. question for Vedran, which, which is tangential. But he said something that sort of startled me, that Praljak was seriously crazy. I mean, could, could Praljak be innocent? Uh, a trial, uh, uh, you mentioned this as an example which, which illustrates very well the whole thing about the conflict and, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of what Balibar and, and Wallace team write about. The whole trial, which is supposed to bring about some kind of a truth about the post Yugoslav conflict, the whole trial is premised on the so called adversarial system where you have two confronted sides and it is the subject of a so called quasi epistemic game. The trial is an epistemic game where there's no guarantee that a guilty verdict is necessarily right or true. Now, when someone who has had an otherwise logical life uh, and is about to serve another two or so years, right, altogether after the guilty verdict, uh, commits a suicide after saying, I'm not a war criminal. Does this mean that he's seriously crazy, or could it mean that the whole quasi epistemic game may be corrupt? Because just because a few guys in robes who could be well be dogs have decided that he's guilty that doesn't necessarily mean that he's guilty if he's willing to take poison to die in order not to be considered a war criminal. Could, could this be a philosophical suicide rather than a pathological suicide? And could the death of Yugoslavia also be a kind of philosophical suicide where some of the actors simply decided that living together was no longer worth it? And could we think about this in a more uncomfortable way than the way we are used to thinking. You know, this cushy way of saying some people broke up Yugoslavia. Could it be that some people committed, some nations committed sort of philosophical suicide because they decided that this kind of life was no longer worth living in the way it was being lived? S S uh, basically, you, you uh, the, by posing the questions, you already answered some of them. Uh, yes, it could be. Uh, yes, it could be. Uh, but but just 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 I mean uh, a, a, another kind of of of, of question here. Uh, so seriously crazy or not? First of all, there is something very banal. Uh, he was in the Hague since 2003, uh, and he, I mean, just like being there for two or three more years and then having giving the life expectancy in Croatia of generals which is close to 85 he could have uh, have like a, a normal normal post war crime uh, life uh, uh, but then uh, which is something which is more serious beyond beyond the question whether there is a kind of a epistemological uh, uh, failure of the Hague and of the global system to produce justice so this is is the, is the system that we have right now producing justice or not producing justice? And The Hague is just a small, small footnote uh, in, in, in this bigger question. Uh, when I just relate this 
question basically to the to the events and happenings in Bosnia and Herzegovina between 1992 and 1995, there is uh, something which lies beyond the epistemology, which is then uh, simply people that were killed. Uh, and, 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 and then you have the, the overarching question uh, in, the, in the wider region of former Yugoslavia. So when Mladic was sentenced, uh, then Dodik immediately said he is a hero and he will be always a hero. Uh, when uh, uh, Prajak was sentenced, the Croats uh, and, and predominantly Croatian fascists and, and national conservatives said he is a hero and he's, he will always be a hero, including the partly Plenković and, 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 and Graba Kitarović, which is not, not, not really EU-like, uh, or it's not uh, the, uh, supposed, uh, the way it should, it should, it's supposed to be. Uh, but uh, and when you then have the Bosniaks, obviously uh, entrenched in the self-victimization, so we are the victims, we have Srebrenica and we have to, to, to be victims uh, eternally uh, as long as we live. Uh, then the question is basically who committed crimes? Who committed crimes? Uh, no one. Uh, and then this stands on the other side of, of this, this question uh, of, of, of justice and, 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 and if there is justice and no justice. So there is no justice. It might be that there is no global justice in the global system. And at the, end, at the other hand, uh, it might be that there are no victims, uh, even though uh, people were killed. So, uh, I don't know, it might be that someone else has, has the, 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 the answer to this million dollar question, uh, but, but this is just what I just, just, uh, just think about it. Yeah, philosophical suicide. The floor is open to everyone, so the audience can also intervene, ask some questions to the participants. And okay. So we're going to close the first session. Uh, Before that. I just, want to talk. I ju I just uh, well, it's a pessimistic intervention. Uh, um, Valida said, well, one of, uh, quoted Bauman actually, that one uh, of the solutions would be to uh, establish direct contact between the host and the migrant and they would exchange uh, their experience. Now, the question is how would they articulate their experiences? And uh, because, look, now Syrians are coming and we think they are people from the third world. We uh, presuppose they are, they are Muslim even though it's not necessary, etc, etc. And we wouldn't define ourselves as Catholic, Orthodox or Muslim speaking with them. But look, if we think about it, the historical experience of Syrians, Iraqians, Afghani people, and Yugoslav people is very much the same. It's anti-colonial struggle at the beginning. It's a national liberation fight. It's socialist revolution with internationalist um, 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 Pretensions. It's failed. Uh, it's failed integration into Arab Federation, Yugoslav Federation, uh, kept a little longer. It's uh, non-alignment, an invention of global uh, of, uh, of profile. Uh, and, fi and finally, it's social state. It's secular state. Arab socialism was secular. Minorities were supporting Assad. Uh, so, our, our, would we be going to articulate our experience in this way? I doubt it because, you know, our heads are full of stereotypes. <laughs> but still, think about it. Syrians and Yugoslavs have the same <laughs> historical experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for this wonderful discussion. We are going to close now the first block, and in the second block, we will have uh, Alexander Fatic, 
Marjan Ivković, Jelena Vasiljević and Aleksandar Fatić, all researchers at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory. Um, so we have three participants here, Jelena Vasiljević, Aleksandar Fatić and Marjan Ivković. And Srđan Prodanović. Alexander, if you, if you want to start, we can we can start now. Thank you. I enjoyed this discussion very much, and, and I apologize in advance for having to leave in about half an hour. So uh, I just asked for a little bit of silence. Thank you so much. We are starting. Uh, my, my my general uh, sort of very brief intervention uh, will relate to primarily to chapter ten of the book, which which is the chapter where Bolivar talks about the uh, sort of transition of the uh, perspective of conflict from classic Marxism, Marxian perception of conflict between classes to what he calls a po post-Marxian, more Hobbesian sort of view of a generalized social conflict where we now live in a situation where conflicts are all around us and they are subject to, uh, as Balibar says, they are subject to many different vectors. These vectors do not necessarily coincide with class divisions, with class identities. Um, and this is, this is something that interests me because um, conflict theory is one of my obsessions. And uh, uh, I wonder, I often wonder whether the whole idea behind much of Western political philosophy, which is predicated on the assumption of a conflict as a necessary, even a logical presupposition of both identity and a relationship with another, of defining yourself as opposed to another, of defining a group, uh, an individual or collective identity as something that is opposed to another, of defining your own views as, as views which are not something else rather than views which are inclusive and which may be conciliatory in themselves whether this is right whether this is justified whether this is sustainable and i think this point by balabar is, is crucial because it basically opens up the room for discussion of whether our western culture and our western political philosophy is fundamentally antagonistic whether it is a philosophy which perpetuates social divisions uh, if you look at, at Marxism as sort of the foundational ideology of the, of the left, the left movement, you see that one of the more malignant aspects of Marxism is that Marxism is predicated on the very assumption of divisiveness. It arises from, the, from, 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 from a generalized, uh, preconceived idea of division, antagonism, class war, class conflict. So without conflict, without this idea of fundamental divisiveness in human society, there's no, no, there's no Marxism. Marxism would not be possible as an ideology. And then Marxism proceeds to sort of suggest various historical and social and economic and economistic, more broadly, ways of overcoming this antagonism by tacitly and, and constantly coquetting with more violence, you know, with more violence, including uh, uh, various kinds of dictatorships, temporary state impositions, you know, uh, followed by gradual processes of dying away of these repressive mechanisms and the state and things like that. But it's all about conflict, about imposition, about violence. Marxism is, is all about violence. And now we have a situation with post-Marxism where again we talk about violence. We have the ideologies which take uh, an unreflected prior position of you know, profit being confronted with human rights, corporations being confronted with uh, world poverty, uh, control, state exercise control being confronted with uh, a kind of human egalitarianism and, and, you know, human collaboration, spontaneity, organic society. So uh, we constantly keep thinking in Western political theory in terms of antagonisms. And uh, uh, I wonder where this brings us in the end. I wonder whether we will end up with all kinds of more isms than we have now. We now have the feminist ideology, which is as totalitarian as communist ideology used to be. We now have 
you know, uh, anti-liberalism. We now talk about neoliberalism and nobody knows what neoliberalism is other than the classic liberal philosophy applied to the economic system. I could never understand what neoliberalism really means. You know, we have all kinds of isms which we assume we know what they mean, whereas in fact they merely denote uh, antagon various antagonistic positions which we largely define as oppositions to something else. And uh, I was recently in China uh, last summer and um, I saw a, a way which sort of left a deep trace in my way of thinking about political theory where uh, uh, people who discuss, Ch when Chinese discuss political philosophy, they don't talk about antagonisms at all. <laughs> they talk about continuities and they disregard differences and antagonisms. When they talk about the Chinese tradition of Marxism, for example, they say every leader of the Chinese Communist Party makes an addition to the tradition of Chinese Communism and is supposed to write a book. So when we talk about the legacy of a leader, we don't talk about the blunders, and there are many blunders that they make. We talk about their contribution to the common legacy. Uh, uh, when they talk about the authoritarianism of the communist regime, they say this is a passing phase, but we're all Chinese. <coughs> and that kind of thinking is uh, largely foreign to Western political philosophy. And Marxism is, is, is largely uh, to blame for that, I think, at least as far as modern political philosophy is, is concerned. So, so my, my, really, my, my sort of worry with regard to what Balibar says, and I agree very much with Balibar, is that we are sort of sinking deeper and deeper into a Hobbesian state of affairs where we, we start to think about emancipation in increasingly particularistic ways. We don't think about human emancipation, we think about particularistic emancipation of this group and that group and that group, as opposed to this group and that group and the society at large. And we end up with more and more cleavages, both theoretical and practical and policy cleavages. And in this way, we end up where we are now, and that this is where, where basically states and elite state groups can exercise soft dictatorship in all kinds of ways because the dominant way of thinking and, and media reporting and engaging in public policy is antagonistic and divisive. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, my comment kind of takes its cue from, from Sasha's. Because uh, what I'm primarily concerned with when, when reading the book is um, one kind of ambiguity that characterizes Balibar's and Wallerstein's approach, which is perhaps, uh, which could perhaps be um, also understood in terms of the difference between Balibar and Wallerstein. And this is the ambiguity of their uh, economism and their ambiguity uh, with regards to the understanding of normative universalism, what it means and how it functions within social reality. Now, um, of course, when reading the book, one clearly uh, gets an impression that Wallerstein is the true economistic thinker, whereas Balibar is oscillating between economism and other forms, or his economism is more ambivalent in itself. And um, this might be a simplified picture because even in Wallerstein, I think there is this ambiguity. I'll try to illustrate it through a couple of quotes, a couple of what I th take to be key uh, reflections of both Balibar and Wallerstein with respect to um, universalism as an ideology that also functions as a productive factor within the capitalist world system. Now. What would be the examples of the most what of the most consistent and partially reductionist economism? Uh, well, there are a few places in, in Wallerstein which tend to look like what I described in the introduction as the post-Yugoslav economism, namely the one that sees phenomena such as nations, such as race, such as gender, as superstructural with respect to to, to economy and as, as the masking of the real relations of power. Now, for example, at one point, Wallerstein says, 
The meritocratic system is politically one of the least stable systems, and it is precisely because of this political fragility that racism and sexism enter the picture. Now, this I take to be an example of quite a reductionist form of economism, where, where basically, um, he says it himself, um, universalism is there to enable the justification for the middle class forms of reproduction for the caters, for the for those who can actually uh, function within a meritocratic system, can move up the social ladder, whereas then racism and sexism enter the picture to structure the rest of the workforce. The ethnicized, racialized minorities, women and everybody aged, the young and, and the aged, everybody who makes a huge contribution to the reproduction of the world system but is not recognized as within the labor force. This is a salient analysis, but it is a very, very pure form of economism, um, which is later on taken up in the last section in the chapters on the class struggle uh, once again. Uh, now, Wollaston himself makes, uh, I would say, a move towards a more complex diagnosis, for example, when he discusses commodification. And he says, at one point, the very expansion of commodification is itself the most profound politicization. If all that is holy is profaned, then there remains no justification for the unequal distribution of reward. Even the individualistic reaction of, quote, more for me, translates into at least my fair share. And this is the most radical political message imaginable. Now, here you can already see a more complex analytical uh, apparatus in Wallerstein, where he kind of broaches what I would like to call the paradigm of critical theory slash Althusser slash Foucault, which is the paradigm of uh, uh, a simultaneous Transform, material transformation of the world, the commodification of everything existing, and the transformation of the realm of ideas, the rise of universalist worldviews with industrial revolution, with the French Revolution, American Revolution, etc., etc. And I will return to that. So, Wallerstein already oscillates between, so when he says commodification is the most profound politicization, there you no, no longer see universalism is merely instrumental in the reproduction, merely covering up the particularist nature of the social reality in capitalism, where the caters can rely on universalism to reproduce themselves, whereas the rest do not have access to it, right? Uh, and then he talks about these ever greater zigs and zags, right, between universalism and particularism. And he says, as time goes by, these zigs and zags are becoming larger, the pushes towards greater institutionalization of universalism on the one hand and the reactions against this on the other, the reactions that require the restraint of the degree to which universalism is institutionalized, which rely then on racism, sexism, etc., etc. Balibar then comes into the picture as the one who really makes things more complicated uh, since he really pushes further what I call the critical theoretic paradigm of understanding the relationship between uh, the relationship between universalism and commodification. So he says he he very much relies on the Gramscian paradigm of hegemony when he says the very identity of the actors depends upon the process of formation and maintenance of hegemony. And then he expands upon this. He says, for example, every social community is reproduced by the functioning of uh, reproduced by the functioning of institutions is imaginary. That is, it's based on the projection of individual existence into the weft of a collective narrative. Or uh, one of, I think, the, the most crucial uh, reflections of his is a reflection of how the fictive ethnicity is constituted. For example, he says, Fictive ethnicity presupposes the constitution of a specific ideological form and ideological in Althusserian terms. It must at one and the same time be a mass phenomenon and the phenomenon of individuation must affect an interpolation of individuals as subjects, which is much more potent than the mere inculcation of political values or rather one that integrates this inculcation into a more elementary process which we may term primary. 
of fixation of the effects of love and hate and representation of the self. So this is a theory of the human subjectivation, basically. The capitalist mode of production and the world system are also one mode of the production of subjectivity. This is very, of course, this is where Balibar is uh, indebted to Althusser, but this is where he comes very close to the paradigm of critical theory, for example, to Adorno, to Alfred Zon Rettel, who, who have uh, developed these very nuanced arguments that basically it is the process of commodification which simultaneously um, produces forms of subjectivity capable of universalist thinking. Uh, but also at the same time it produces subjects incapable of extricating themselves from what is basically uh, a, 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 a form of domination. And this form of domination is best theorized, for example, in the late Adorno as the iron cage of conceptual thought or the iron cage of universalist thought, the iron cage of abstract thought, uh, which basically includes within itself three dimensions of domination, intersubjective domination, right, class antagonism, exploitation, the domination of our uh, the domination that is practiced by ourselves with respect to ourselves, so self-domination, and the destruction of nature, right? A three-dimensional domination uh, brought together under what is basically conceptual thought. Now, um, I'll be very short now. My, my, my doubt, my question is, uh, if both Belibar and Wallerstein accept the premise of what I call critical theoretic understanding of um, universalism slash commodification, if there is basically no way of easily uh, abandoning, easily overcoming this form of symbolic and material reproduction of society at the same time, and I think real socialist societies testify to this failure, to this impossibility, then the question is, um, what would class struggle ultimately bring about? Now, it's usually argued that uh, real socialist societies failed to overcome domination, became state capitalist societies with nomenclatura uh, substituting the capitalist class because they had to compete with capitalism, right? And as long as they had to compete with capitalism, they had to compete in the efficiency of capitalist domination, right? But then, if we take the, the second, this, this is if we take the standard economistic angle of analysis. We can then say once we overcome the bourgeois social formation, we can overcome bourgeois liberalism, bourgeois universalism, and implement a more substantive form of universalism of some kind. But then, if we take the critical theoretic angle, then even the world revolution, even the, uh, let's say, even the institutionalization of an alternative to capitalism on global scale would once again produce some kind of a global state capitalism, would also produce an alternative global form of domination that we would not easily be able to overcome since we would still be underpinned by what Valibar calls the violent desire to know, the violent desire to totalize, to have absolute knowledge, to have absolute domination of nature, absolute domination of absolute transparency of ourselves, etc. So this is where I want to introduce the postmodernist sensitivity of the third paradigm that we mentioned in the previous uh, section and ask the question, but then how does one overcome this kind of thinking and uh, whether, whether actually we, we, we have no positive agenda, we have no positive vision of utopia, but uh, we have to first think about a kind of revolution within this paradigm, which would then open up space for really imagining alternative ways of relating to ourselves, nature, and, and intersubjectivity. Thanks. I'll try to be, I'll try to be brief. Um, um, well, I've chosen to comment uh, specifically on two thoughts from the book, uh, from the first part on, on racism, one by Balibar and the other one by Wallerstein, but actually from the perspective of 
uh, Balibar's obsession with contradictions of universalism, which of course go beyond this book. And in this respect, it's the link between the universalism and violence that is in focus. So for Balibar, exclusion and, and therefore violence is part and parcel of, of universalism because openness to all, this a move to, to all inclusiveness, potentially everyone should join in, is burdened by conditions and I would say in a double sense that first there are historical and social conditions of, of every universalism and secondly there are conditions to be met uh, to enjoy the community of all and for all. And I'll just think of Christianity for example where everyone is invited to join in but there will be damned right as the constitutive narrative goes so we may maybe we maybe can't say up front who will be damned but some damned souls uh, uh, meaning some who will not be able to properly join in is essential for the universalism of the faith. And Balibar is very right to note that um, it is not universalism as such that entails violence and exclusion, it's the combination of universalism and community. And I will come back to this. So the two thoughts, or actually two sentences that I want to focus on, the first one is um, Balibar's definition of the racist complex. So he says, what constitutes the racist complex, according to him, is a combination of a misrecognition and the will to know, which Marian just, uh, just invoked. So misrecognition, and then I quote him, without, without which the violence would not be tolerable to the very people engaging in it. And the will to know a violent desire for immediate knowledge of social relations. So these two elements constitute the racist complex, misrecognition and violent desire for immediate knowledge. Now, with these two uh, terms, he really defines uh, racism as a really modern concept because uh, since he introduced the categories of recognition and, and misrecognition, you know, immediately af um, after Charles Taylor, we know that recognition uh, figures as a, this concept defining, um, concept re replacing the, the central figure of honor in the Ancien Regime, and then we have this uh, politics of, of difference, which Balibar also sees as universalism. So politics of difference is not something, it's not a particularism that is opposing to, to, to politics of the universal. It's also, it's another universalism, and to him, the major shocks actually come when two and many, uh, many universalism clash. Uh, so when we talk about misrecognition, which guides actually the violence, which misrecognition, which, um, which those who perpetrate the violence um, serve to uh, as a justification. We talk about modern phenomena, and also when we talk about this violent desire for immediate knowledge of social relations, that implies that these social relations are really, really complex and hard to discern. So this is why we violently want to immediately know what they are. And we could argue that since they are uh, becoming more and more complex, this violence to know them could become uh, uh, more, um, uh, 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 could, could become more violent as well. And this fits nicely also with his other assertion about racism without races or differentialist racism, which we could juxtapose to politics of differences because what they do share uh, is uh, the, the look at the ontological status or the ontological existence of cultures. So what we have in this narrative is a clash of two universalism, racist one, even in, uh, in racism, which is implicated in some forms of secularism and humanism, we could argue, and that of polit politics of difference, to universalism in which the community figures is a very important uh, category. And on some other places, Bolivar argues that for the destruction of racist complex, we also need to destroy the community created by racism, the community of, of, of racists, which also corresponds to some other of his ideas where um, we should look for a kind of universalism that would go beyond community so that we could build a universal without, uh, to, universal that could be pluralized uh, without being diluted to a sum of particularities, something along that line. Uh, this is all a bit confusing, and I will come back to it, uh, but I now I want to, to go to this other uh, thought by, by Wallerstein when he differentiates racism as an ideology pertinent to capitalism, differentiates it from xenophobia, uh, from, uh, from some um, past historical uh, constitution where he said in xenophobia, 
uh, we reject or we just eliminate uh, others, where in racism, reject, uh, rejection is not welcome because uh, racism is meant to keep people inside uh, the work system. Every labor power is needed. And I'm wondering how much it is true, especially in today's uh, highly financialized capitalism, when we don't need all that uh, labor power uh, to keep uh, to keep uh, capital accumulating. So uh, modern, modern capitalism can actually afford to eject people and many people are in fact superfluous. So what we have is, as a de fact, we have superfluous populations uh, that are not, whose labor power is not needed for capital to keep, uh, keep on accumulating. These populations are arguably in a search of communities to belong to, communities which expel them. We also have clashing exclusive universalisms uh, whether in forms of secularism and humanitarian humanitism or hum humanism or in form of politics of difference so we have a uh, clashing exclusive universalism and a utopistic proposition to build a new universalism but the one that is not that should not be based on a community right in an epoch strongly colored by community form thinking so uh, I'm just wondering is this the impasse in which we find ourselves in and is it possible for us to think any emancipatory politics uh, from that point, having uh, these pessimistic insights on mind? That's all. Thanks. And last in this round, Sergeant. Okay, so because time is becoming ever more precious, I'm going to be uh, really, really short. So my question pertains to the uh, part of the book that refers to the, the, the class. And I just want to raise a couple of issues more than to elaborate on some particular problems of, of, of that uh, chapter. First, uh, I want to raise the question of social change and the, in this world of anti-reductionistic universability. So, uh, Borstein argues that, in fact, if we look at the core idea of Marx, which is the polarization of classes, that in, uh, contrary to the, to the dominant view in the 80s that it is uh, not rising, it is, in fact, rising when you look at it as, as a historical process within the world system. So, uh, my question is, well, if we don't have the classical uh, notion of uh, uh, organization of, of this kind of uh, articulation of, of this problem that we have where uh, there is polarization of classes, if we don't have a new Cominterna which is you know, premised on some kind of reductionist Marxism, why there is no alternative, why there is no new grouping here? And uh, we can take a, a, a particular uh, uh, cue from, from a quotation uh, of Wallerstein where he says that what is actually uh, 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 masking the visibility of class antagonism is the lack of articulation between social, political, and the theoretical. And what, what I think is lacking in the book, and perhaps what is lacking he, when we are now trying to, to articulate this global global issues of, of inequality is the fact that we still have this kind of positivistic uh, outlook on, on this kind of problems. I think that when we are trying to see the, 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 uh, the problems, we are focused on structures more than on dynamics, the processes and their intersubjectivity as Marian argued, is, 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 is a complex thing that should be looked in many layers. So I just wanted to raise this kind of questions more than to, to, to elaborate on any kind of, 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 of more of detailed account of, of what is this. So yeah, that's it. Thanks. Um, OK. Uh, one of the speakers has much there to leave, but um, anyone is welcome to ask for any clarification or elaboration. Yes, Igor? Mm -hmm. I have just a minor question that should probably be a interesting plot, but it's for you. You took on the reception of Bolivar. Did you look at uh, some informal reception and alternative in southern society? Because uh, I'll consider it uh, not study at the faculty because generally humanistic orientation of intellectuals is axiom, but it's worked at least from 19th and at least in Belgrade 
uh, in many student readings and some kind of left movements. So probably there there will be some uh, reflection of this book and some of the students. So we tried to look in archives in online libraries and the kind of research that that kind of approach would require to do kind of an ethnography. I mean, you would have to physically go into the spaces and, and ask around and ask people if, if they were reading such a book, which we haven't done. I don't Probably know. Some, some non, non academic editions. That, that is my. The, I think that there are two articles that are non academic. I mean, it depends what you mean by academic and, you know, how do you separate. Yeah. But I think that we addressed articles that did not. Uh, that were not published in academic journals, journals per se, but that were published in some venues that were supported by NGOs and etc. So we were just really careful about actually looking for places where where anything referring to Balibar and Morrison book actually appeared. So we didn't really pay attention into the division between well, if it's an academic, it means this, and if it's a non-academic, it means this. If that was your question. We didn't. We didn't make that difference. Okay. So I just have a brief question here about misrecognition. I'm not convinced uh, by by the the recognition and misrecognition that that leads to racism, because it would imply that that there is a right way to recognize somebody. And I'm, I'm just, I, I'm not convinced. And so I, I don't know where he comes up with misrecognition as a source of racism. I, I don't think that there's a right way. Uh, I don't think that when you say misrecognition, it's, it's not implying that there is a right way to recognize someone and misrecognition is missing this right way. It's just that people who are recognized do not agree with this. Uh, uh, recognition of the race, like misrecognition in terms of I recognize you as such as such and you don't really agree with being recognized as such as such. So it's like misrecognition is not that uh, that you don't have a perfect match of the reality of your identity and then the projection of your identity by those who are racist. Or I don't know, it's just that misrecognition means, I mean, that, that's how I read it even in from Bolivar and also in, in politics recognition in Charles Taylor. It's just that you have this definition of you, you, put, you put people into categories and you put labels on them and they do not agree with those labels. And it's, it's, this whole logic and philosophy does not imply that there is a right way of recognizing someone. But I, I do agree that the, the whole problem is, of course, and then the politics of identity. Then you cannot, you have these uh, unexpected consequences, or sometimes expected, something sometimes worked for, I don't know. But it is a problem like, uh, is, is uh, identity uh, something that is fixed and stable and then should be recognized? And, but this is the problem is, what I said is very formal, is whatever you might, might think of politics of difference and recognition, we live in a, in a time, in an epoch that is heavily marked by politics of recognition and identities. We cannot go back. So we cannot really say that we are, even, even if we have this harsh criticism on the politics of difference, politics of identity, politics of recognition, we live this uh, in, in, in an epoch which is highly critical of it, we still live in times which are very much much marked by, by this whole thing. And it works, I mean, it's true, we can still say that the definition of the racist complex is true, that the, the misrecognition is an important play, is an important part, perhaps has an important role in this racist complex, so we could, and we could ask questions, why? Why is it still so? Why is it that recognition and misrecognition play a very important role in, in, today's, in today's world? Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, now, recognition is a philosophical uh, category. It's actually Hegelian category and an Anerkennung and it's central to um, to Hegel's uh, anthropology. Now Taylor is uh, Charles Taylor who introduced the politics of recognition during the 90s, and that was an extremely uh, influential uh, book. Um, 
He is a Hegelian scholar, but doesn't quote Hegel in his uh, text. And he has a book, a huge book on Hegel, where he has a list of German terms that uh, figure in the text. Anerkennung is not there. That's very, very bizarre. Now, why? I, I have a theory about that. Namely, uh, you make difference, or at least you suggest a difference between uh, misrecognition and recognition, um, suggesting that misrecognition is a mechanism of domination. I would push this further and say recognition in itself cannot avoid being a mechanism of domination because it presupposes an instance who recognizes. And look now let's look concretely. Uh, in uh, state minorities, in the juridical construction of state, minorities are fighting for recognition, which means that they recognize as valid, as legitimate, the juridical apparatus from uh, which they want to be recognized, and uh, this will uh, better their status. Now, in international affairs, uh, there is no fixed uh, instance of recognition. You want to be recognized by international community. What does that mean? It means uh, Western uh, central states uh, led by the United States. Uh, which means being recognized by the military political dominant force. And all those little states where we are living now were trying to get recognition from the, from the, from the international community and you see uh, uh, what was the process. Uh, the process was peripherization and, and, and colonial dependence, but you gained re recognition. So I would suggest to think in concrete terms in this direction. It's a, it's a very dangerous category, especially when you cannot exclude this uh, relation of domination. But, <laughs> yeah, well, on this point, I, I still suggest reading Marx's contribution to the Jewish question, being critique of French Revolution. Uh, well, he has a, an emancipatory project, which we lack. He has this radical humanist uh, project of an emancipation of human generic being, which we kind of two, two centuries later we don't have, or 150 years later we don't have any more but still yeah you're right yeah human rights is lacking is a, is a kind of insufficient project precisely for this thank you any further questions yes Not necessarily about the region. There are some. There were some who didn't write about the region. Uh, for example, Kuyun, the mentioned Kuyunjic. Uh, yeah, because, and, the said it, uh, because we had to research reception in the region. That means not authors from other parts of the world yeah, writing about the region. What was your suggestion that the book could have been a uh, good explanatory tool for destruction of Yugoslavic wars of Yugoslavia? So it would be, I yes, say, potentially. It would be logical to explore the reception of the book. Region, by the scholars of the, of the region, region, yes, that would be a further a further step to investigate necessarily, yes. Um, and also, with, with respect to to the whole question of recognition and, and uh, 
let's just mention that uh, in this text which compares Derrida and, and Balibar, there is this thesis that you know, Western thought from the ancient Greeks to today has uh, precisely an inbuilt tendency to create these schemes, classificatory schemes, hierarchizations and exclusions, and, and that's where Derrida can function as a supplement to Balibar, as we argued. Like, um, for example, explore, you know, in a broader sense than, than, than simply the capitalist world system, but also a kind of Western tradition that goes beyond modernity, these mechanisms that, that universal, as they call it, universal racism, just a short note in that respect. Okay. Thank you all. We'll have a short break and then we're coming back with the third block. Thank you so much. Welcome back. We have a third block and uh, in which we will have uh, Gordon Maslow from Center for Social and Humanities Research from Croatia, Davide Pala, Carlo Burelli, and Monica Cano, fellows at the Center for Advanced Studies of Southern Eastern Europe at the University of Rijeka, Croatia, uh, Marco Božić from Paris Sorbonne, and Adriana Zaharijevic. So before we start, I just want to make a brief remark that we will have this session and then a fourth session where we'll all come back together to tie um, all of these discussions from today. So thank you. Uh, Gordon, would you like to start first, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Georgia. Um, all right, I'll try to be brief, and if I overstep my boundaries, please cut me off uh, immediately. Um, uh, I'll try to, uh, what I'll give in a couple of 10 minutes will be just some, pre uh, some remarks and speculations um, and comments on certain tendencies I find at work. And um, to start, um, it seems to me that one thing has had, which had not been mentioned uh, um, uh, is, is that this is a book on historical materialism and Marxism also. And it seems to me, when rereading it now for this uh, purpose, it's, it's, it, it seems interesting because we have a dialogue and we do not have a dialogue between these two authors. And this is something uh, to which I'll try to return uh, later. But just to uh, give one brief remark, it's interesting how uh, when, re when reading this book, um, and I'm sure that I'm not the only person here that shares this uh, uncanny feeling, is that it's a book writ written or addressed to us at this moment. And um, it, it, there is a certain paragraph in um, um, when Barbar writes that it is semi-periphery, which is a privileged uh, place for politics uh, today. And you know whether we can speak today that um, semi-periphery is something that is generalized, globalized, as Nagy would have argued. Um, it's, just, it's interesting because when you show where this seminar is being taken, where it is taking place in the world, it's usually uh, peripher peripheral or semi-peripheral countries, um, Belgrade, uh, it's India, it's uh, South Africa, etc., Argentina, etc., etc. So it seems to speak to a certain people from a certain place in a certain time. So just these were some brief remarks. I'm going to come back to them later. Um, first of all, um, I believe it's. Um, um, race, race, nation, class uh, represents a theoretical and political challenge uh, to us today, uh, especially to the people on the left. And um, it seems to me that um, it is uh, it, 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 it's um, its challenge is a part of the problem why it hadn't been hadn't been hadn't been received as well in the context of ex Yugoslavia. And I completely agree with you on this point. Um, so, um, specifically, I believe the problem is, uh, and it's peculiar because, as you mentioned, with the situation in, in Southeast Europe, ex Yugoslavia, war, and etc., it, it basically is the fact that for Balibar, uh, historical materialism is and, um, prim uh, primarily a process or analysis of the processes of uh, idealization. 
but constructing identity. And this process is for him tied to economical movements. Of course, this relation is uh, it's, it, it's a problematic uh, relationship. Um, so, um, first of all, it seems to me interesting. Uh, interesting thing um, is that uh, in this critique, um, Balibar relies often on Foucault, and uh, especially on his critique of liberalism, um, and he accentuates. Uh, for example, things um, like um, anthropology, epistemology, um, problems of uh, practice of racism, state racism, institutionalized racism, etc., etc. So I'll just try to be brief, since I already uh, spent a lot of my time, and try to put up four original remarks. Uh, first, would be the first one would be that, um, or the second would be. Uh, something already mentioned that nation cannot be uh, exclusively a project of bourgeoisie. So this is the problem why left, theoretical left, on um, in this, in this area at Yugoslavia, has a problem of using this book or reading or critically engaging this book. Um, uh, we can reformulate this problem and ask a historiographical, uh, um, prob um, or historiographical question, and that is: Is the dissolution of Yugoslavia uh, and this creation of not only national but nationalistic states, primarily um, class project, or an expression of the cl uh, crisis of class politics? Um, second remark would be. Um, um, and this is something that, uh, according uh, to Balibar, at least, um, um, around uh, this is a question around Balibar and Wallerstein do not seem to agree, and already has been mentioned here. And this is the question of the status of the nation. Um, um, and it seems to me that um, um, status of the nation, according to Balibar, it, it, it is more ambivalent than it is for Wallerstein, and um, uh, Balibar accentuates this racist supplement, internal supplement to, to nationalism. And I believe that this is especially um, problematic in, in, in the notions of, in the countries of semi-periphery, and this is really speculative thesis, is um, um, Balibar accentuates, uh, I mean, he's not, he started as an Arthasarian, and his relationship to, to Arthasar is quite difficult now, um, uh, but there is something in, which he introduces in, in the book, and this is, that is the distinction between social formation and modes of production. And he argues explicitly that, that his intention is to criticize and think social formation, which can, according to Althusser, contain different modes of production at the same time, which means basically that there is not one class, be it bourgeoisie, be it uh, labor, uh, working class, uh, there is not one mode, mode of domination, there is not one mode of exploitation. And I believe this is especially uh, pertinent for these uh, semi-peripheral uh, spaces. Um, and uh, the question which, which we can ask here is uh, to, to, to what extent can the nation state maintain this or reproduce this social formation uh, in line with all these um, sometimes contradictory or, um, forces that are pulling to, uh, pulling to part. For example, when speaking about memories and history, um, there's, a diff there's an interesting thing uh, I haven't mentioned. It's basically, my intervention is strictly conjunctural, and um, from a given context, I was reading it. Um, someone mentioned Slobodan Pralya, for example. And there's a strong tendency in Croatia, for example, to uh, dissolve history even nationalistic history, which has been institutionalized history for at least uh, 20, 30, 20, 20 something, something years, into a kind of uh, question of memories. Um, and um, uh, the role of the nationalistic history, which it hadn't been, um, it hadn't been, uh, uh, historiography wasn't too su successful in doing, is to kind of reconcile these different memories, for example, the World War II, etc., etc. And just one brief remark, if I may, two minutes. Uh, and that is um, the question of um, uh, of kind of uh, epistemological politics, which Balibar um, 
uh, tries to analyze between nationalism and racism. And so, for example, uh, we heard earlier about uh, his definition of racism as a violent will to know. And it's interesting because if we just reflect a bit, uh, this will to know uh, and racism as such comes from a different place, comes from nationalism as internal supplement. And um, we could identify nationalism with the will not to know. So if we have a kind of um, Foucauldian, if you, if you pardon me, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Foucault, <laughs> a kind of Foucauldian idea coming out of the Freudian idea of repression. Um, and it seems to me interesting, how does this new occur? And um, I'll finish with this. Thank you. Marco, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I will try to use this limited time, this 10 minutes which I got. Uh, just to expose to the discussion, maybe to critics, uh, uh, one detail, detail which attracted a lot of my attention in uh, chapter 4, titled The Construction of the Nation, written by uh, Walter Steen. Uh, the chapter which was actually dedicated to the question, to the place that Walter Steen tried to explain. Uh, the place of the nation, of the na nation, of the nationalism, of the uh, national state in his theory of the world system, uh, and uh, that detail is actually on the page 81. It, the problem, in my opinion, starts when Warstein said that in almost every case, statehood preceded nationhood that actually there was always firstly the state, and then it was the state which created a nation for itself. So that the state is basically, the national state is basically only the latest form, the modern form of the state. And uh, even when it seems that it was otherwise, uh, it wasn't, because firstly, Weinstein said, uh, arose within when nationalism uh, seems that when it seems that nationalism created a state that wasn't the case because that nationalism arose within some kind of administrative frontiers uh, it means that there was always some kind of the state maybe not independent state but some kind of the proto-state before nationalism and secondly, because uh, it is always the question how deep was the root of that, uh, of that nationalism. In my opinion, Wallerstein is wrong about this because he tried to present, tried to explain that national state building process as unique, that there was only one needle type of that process. In my opinion, there is at least two needle types at least two national state building processes. In the first place, because the national state in the, West, in the Western countries, in the core of the world system, in my opinion, doesn't have the same meaning as it has on, on the other side, on periphery, in the East, Eastern and Central Europe, in Eastern and Central European states. So we have basically two traditions, the Western tradition of the nation, national state and the Eastern peripheral tradition of the, of the national state. Two patterns, actually. In the first pattern, Western pattern, the national state was the result of a long evolutive process of the integration of the internal market in the, in, in the frontiers of that state. And it was that integ integration of the internal market which homo homogenized the various uh, religious, linguistic, ethnical groups. And it was some kind of the smooth uh, 
functioning of the state, of the state institutions as, for example, public school system or modern army concept, which promoted that common self-identification of the people as a nation. And the final result of that process, long evolutive process, smooth functioning of the institution was the idea, what was the, actually the complete transformation of political body of that state. Political body traditionally was understand as, uh, was traditionally composed by the members of the nobility. In the end of this process, we have a national state, which is actually the people state. It means the, not only the nobility, but whole entire people participate now in a, in a, in a, in a decision, in the, in the making of political decisions. So, in my opinion, Western pattern and Western notion of the, of the national state is actually the people state, that is the meaning of the na nationalism or the, na the, the nation in the discourse of French, French Revolution. On the other side, in the Central and in the Eastern Europe, we don't have this process. We don't have that smooth evolution, that smooth functioning of the state and state institution in the first place because there was no the cent highly centralized state. That was the case, with, for example, with the German or Italy in the time, or we didn't have any state. Uh, what was the case with the Eastern huge multi-confessional empires like Russia, Austrian Empire, Ottoman Empire. Uh, that uh, smooth functioning of the state uh, didn't exist because uh, the in internal market and internal market economy was simply less developed and integrative processes were slow and less powerful. So it allowed affirmation of all these nationalism of distinctive religious, linguistic or uh, ethnic groups within these empires and Keep in mind that that was the time of the Romanticism. That means the time when we believe that by affirmation of the national culture, national art, literature, poetry, and especially history writing, we can achieve some national goals. For example, and in the first place, preparation of that people at that nation for the final struggle for national independence and creation of the national state. So. I don't believe that we have a unique, unidimensional pattern of that national state building process, as Wallerstein proposed. What he did, it was actually that he universalized that Western pattern, but at least two patterns. The first pattern is the Western, which is marked by evolution and integration, and which somehow tends to supreme the frontiers between the uh, distinctive groups uh, in a state. And on the other side, in the Eastern Europe, we have the process which is more uh, marked by the revolution, national revolution, and uh, exclusion. And it's challenge the existing borders in order to, uh, to, make, the, in order to make new ones. So uh, that is the reason why I don't believe that we have that this uh, explanation, which is of Weinstein, Weinstein approach to this problematic, uh, is uh, somehow unidimensional. I believe that that place of the nation and national, national state uh, is important in this theory, but that is more complex. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. We will hear now Davide. Thank you. Um, um, uh, in my case, uh, I, I would just like to focus on, uh, on the third um, chapter of the book, um, which um, 
Balibar um, addresses the question, the relation between nationalism and racism. Uh, in particular, I, I want to focus on, on the, centra, the central uh, claim that uh, Balibar advances, that is, uh, the, the claim that racism maintains a necessary relation with uh, nationalism. Um, so, uh, uh, in his words, uh, Balibar's central claim is that racism understood as a, and I quote, historical system of both exclusion and domination, maintains a necessary relation with nationalism. Now, um, as I understand this claim, uh, according to Balibar, racism is a mechanism that has different historical manifestations, but, I mean, an invariant and stable aim. This aim is the exclusion and the domination of some individuals. More importantly, uh, according to Balibar, um, th this mechanism uh, of both exclusion and domination, which he calls racism, would be part and parcel of nationalism. Uh, uh, that is, as I said before, uh, racism would be uh, a necessary or constitutive, uh, uh, rather than just a supplement uh, element of nationalism. This would be cr uh, true uh, in most uh, in most cases, if uh, we treat the nationalism uh, as a factual phenomenon, while it would be likely uh, uh, if we understand nationalism uh, as an idea, and that's Balibar. Now, uh, I think that there are two possible uh, interpretations uh, of this claim. So first we can uh, understand nationalism uh, as a factual phenomenon and, and, and then interpret Balibar's claim as a thesis about the history of nationalism. Or second, we can understand nationalism as an idea and then interpret Balibar's claim as a thesis about the idea uh, uh, of nationalism. Then l l let's discuss briefly these, these, these two interpretations in turn. So, according to the first interpretation uh, uh, of the claim advanced by, by Balivar, um, racism is a necessary component of nationalism in the sense that in history, building nations always involved uh, racist policies. Now, uh, uh, I believe that uh, if this, is cla this claim is understood in a deflated way, that is, uh, as a claim addressing historical regularities uh, rather than necessities, it could tell us an interesting and likely story about nationalism. It is indeed true that, uh, I mean, many if not most national movements, nationalist movements, sorry, uh, built and keep on building nation through uh, racist policies. Uh, uh, in other words, I mean, I, I find compelling the idea that several nations were built and are being built uh, by means of racist uh, actions and policies. Uh, and I also accept the claim that this regularity is not is not a mere coincidence, but rather is a, a relation that can, can be explained in a rational manner. Uh, yet, I refuse uh, somehow the idea that this relation can be said historically necessary. Uh, indeed, from historical uh, regularities, one cannot infer relations that are necessary. Then, uh, let me just discuss um, the second then, uh, interpretation of Balibar's claim. In this case, uh, racism would be uh, uh, a necessary component of the idea rather than, uh, 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 I mean, of the idea of nationalism rather than nationalism as a factual phenomenon. Uh, uh, in this case, I have to say that I find this interpretation more problematic than the previous one. Uh, as a matter of fact, this interpretation would be sound only if two conditions applied, that is, First, it is not possible to elaborate the idea of a good nationalism. And second, racism, uh, understood in very broad terms, uh, is said to be present whenever a policy of both exclusion and domination of some uh, individuals uh, occurs. And then uh, it, is, it is then uh, no coincidence that Balibar claims both that the distinction between bad and good nationalism is not fundamental and that a very broad definition of racism is not problematic. And yet I think that the, the, the two conditions above uh, uh, do not apply. So, first, uh, I think that we can and should develop uh, the idea of, uh, of a good nationalism. 
this is the case because, I mean, from a methodological point of view, uh, uh, we need an evaluati evaluative standard to assess past and current, and current factual manifestations of nationalism. Um, moreover, if uh, we think that our ideas uh, have a practice guidance role, uh, then uh, we need the idea of a good nationalism in order to know what is the appropriate way to build and develop nations in the real world. Also, and I think that this is the crucial point, we need the idea of, good na of a good nationalism because um, we want to grasp many significant aspects uh, of nation, uh, uh, notably those raising question of justice. For instance, we want to know why and what ways nations are are or seem fundamental for the preservation of both uh, democracy and social justice and other questions like this one. Um, in a regard then to the second condition co concerning just the definition of racism, uh, I mean, I, I believe that we should avoid, avoid two broad definitions of racism. In particular, um, we should avoid those definitions of racism that equate it with whatever policy of exclusion of some, job, uh, some, some individuals conjoined with their do domination. Um, on the one hand, nations are groups, and are gr as groups they can admit some members and exclude others. I think that this possibility per se is neither unjust nor racist. Uh, our judgment uh, about it will vary according to the criteria employed for the admission of new members, that is, whether they are justified or not. On the other hand, domination is certainly something very bad, but not every form of domination is racist. This is the case only if the, the, the arbitrary power, that is the dominating power, is, uh, is exercised in a racist manner. Briefly, I think that there is something specific about racism that Balibar's account does not grasp. Now, I will not provide a good definition of racism, I just wanted to show that Balibar's um, definition is uh, uh, too broad. Then, uh, just to conclude, if my remarks are sound, then uh, it follows that uh, racism is not a necessary component of nationalism, understood either as a fact or uh, as an idea. We can only claim that, from a historical point of view, uh, racism, racism and nationalism often uh, go hand in hand. And that's all. Thank you so much. <laughs> we'll hear now Carlo Burelli. Thank you very much. Uh, Just, <clears throat> the book we are all discussing today is very is very rich and each chapter alone would require specific reflection and raise particular doubts and comments. However, I want to tackle just one important point which I think emphasizes the crucial actuality of this book. One of the large underlying themes is the disagreement between Wallerstein and Balibar about the existence of a world bourgeoisie. I find uh, Wallerstein's claim that the bourgeoisie is unconstrained by national feeling an enlightening intuition. And I want to push it to a more uncomfortable con conclusion by linking it to the crisis of the national welfare state. Wallerstein states, and I quote, a bourgeoisie can exist only at the world level. That being a bourgeois means precisely that one cannot be loyal to any community. Big capitalists have never hesitated to export their capital from their own country if their country was declining as a locus of <coughs> profitable investment." End quote. Following this line of reasoning, I'm going to suggest that capitalism has actually abandoned nationalism. And this is not entirely a good thing, as it might prima facie seem. There is an extensive literature on the degree to which the national welfare state requires bounded solidarity to motivate redistribution. Keith Banting and Will Kim Licka, for example, recently published a book on this topic entitled The Strains of Commitments, the Political Sources of Solidarity in Diverse Societies, Oxford University Press, 2017. Here, they collect a plurality of opinions on the topic from both political philosophers and empirical social scientists. Many contributions to this volume suggest that the we feeling of solidarity, which are necessary to support social justice, are undergoing a sensible erosion. 
Moreover, empirical evidence suggests that redistributive solidarity requires thicker communal feelings, which at the present time uncomfortably seem to be provided exclusively by national identities. David Miller recently defended such a thesis, for example. I want to provocatively claim that cosmopolitan values so prevalent now in academic settings and which indeed permeate the very texture of our liberal societies are perfect fit to support the interests of the rich bourgeoisie. As Balibar and Wallerstein's book reveals, historically the capital needed to support uh, the capital needed to support nation states because the productive infrastructure and thus their uh, prevalent source of profit was territorially bounded. Thirty years after the book, Wallerstein's reference to the world bourgeoisie is even more appropriate. Nowadays, capitalistic forces can easily relocate across borders, not only finance, which is obviously immaterial, but many services and industries can now find national borders just as porous. This means that they have no interest in supporting national states at all and thus are less willing maintaining the ideology structure necessary to, as Wallerstein argues, uh, promote their cohesion and lessen the threats of internal disintegration and external aggression. Now I want to bring your attention to the worrying trend of the rise of extremist far-right parties Brexit, Trump, Le Pen, Austria, Sweden, Italy, Germany are too many instances for it to be a mere coincidence. The reason why this trend is worrying is because it enjoys a high support from the lower sections of society, while it encounters a strong opposition from the so-called winners of globalization, the rich and highly educated new bourgeoisie. The rise of the far right is the political backlash against the harshening of the divide between winners and losers. It is indeed tempting to dismiss the worry of the poor working class as either mistaken or misled by other actors, while their belief that the far right might help them is likely misplaced, obviously, the uncomfortable truth is that the current left is not likely to lessen their unfortunate situation either. One reason is that many countries, in many countries the left adopted a broadly liberal view of economic. But a more subtler and perhaps deeper reason, however, is that the less critical view of nationality undermines the we feeling which, by binding rich and poor together in a nation state, are currently required to support its welfare apparatus and thus social justice. Concluding these brief reflections, cosmopolitan liberal values undermine national fellow feeling, which are necessary to support social justice, at least at the present time, supplying little in its place to motivate redistributive transfers. What Wallerstein's view of the world bourgeoisie raises thus the following uncomfortable worry. Is cosmopolitan really a progressive force? Why does it seem to match the interest of the world bourgeoisie so well? Thank you for your attention. Thank you. We will hear now Monica Cano. Um, thank you. My commentary is going to focus on some of the issues that I, br that I brought up in the first part, universal racism. In these first chapters, they want to contest the liberal humanist idea of socioeconomic process, progress. They argue that racism and sexism are the traits of society that are indeed progressing. This argument is painfully up to date. Regarding heterosexism, numerous authors are currently raising their voices on the urgency of addressing the growing violence against women and LGBT people. Rita Laura Segato argues that Mexico and other parts of Central America have undergone a process of Juarization, the type of cruel, vicious violence against women that was characteristic of Ciudad Juarez, has been expanded to the whole Mexican territory and also to El Salvador, Honduras, or Guatemala. The Spanish, um, and yesterday at the conference testimony, Poetry and Language, we witnessed some testimony about this gangrenous violence in the poem by Maria Rivera's Los Muertos, the dead, that it was very 
very, very moving. The Spanish philosopher Maria Jose Guerra Palmero states that we are witnessing an increasing production of vulnerability. The individuals that are considered as the other racialized or sexualized others are more and more susceptible of suffering different kinds of violences that impede, if not completely preclude, their sus the sustainability of their lives. And indeed, this feminist decolonial analysis proved Bolivar and Wallerstein right. We cannot understand sexism and racism as separate parcels of the system, as, and I quote them, the two are in fact intimately linked. End of quote. No, they can be sexism and racism understood as separated from humanist liberalism. It is my understanding that Bolivar and Wallerstein consider racism and sexism as tools that are used by liberalism and humanism to keep the binaries that sustain them. The European ideal of progress divides humanity in two main groups. Bolivar, in, in the chapter Is There a New Racism, says, I quote, the one assumed to be universalistic and progressive, the other group supposed irremediably particularistic and primitive, end of quote. Who lives in each one of these groups? Whose lives matter and whose lives don't? The human subject, as uh, Judith Butler points out, is framed by the humanist conception of it. Following Deleuze and Guattari's conceptualization, I would say, and I quote, the constant or standard is the average adult white heterosexual European male speaking a standard language. As Butler suggests, this normative type of the human that is impossible, uh, it's an ideal that is impossible to be embodied, consequently creates othernesses that are, of course, rejected and feared, as uh, Valida pointed out before. Um, it creates bodies that, don't ma that non sorry, bodies that do not matter, disposable object subjects. Racialized, racialized otherness, uh, sexualized otherness and naturalized otherness um, that, is, uh, that are completely rejected and abjected from the system. Racism and sexism are thus, as Bolivar and Wallerstein argue, part of the humanist system, the same system that claims to advocate universal rights. Wallerstein echoes a critique of the false universalism of the humanist subject that we can already find in Simone de Beauvoir's Second Sex. I'm going to quote a little, a, um, a long uh, quote by Wallerstein. The modern world, we have long been told, is the first to reach beyond the bounds of narrow local loyalties and to proclaim the universal brotherhood of man, or so we were told up to the 1970s. Since that time, we have been made conscious that the very terminology of universalist doctrine, as for example the phrase the brotherhood of man, belies itself since this phrase is masculine in gender, thereby implicitly excluding or relegating to a secondary sphere all who are female." End of quote. Thus, racism and sexism are inherent to humanist and liberal systems. And, as they claim, these characteristic traits are increasing. Considering their, their analysis, we come to understand that they are structural and in inherent to liberalism and humanism. But if this is so, how do we combat them? How do we struggle against characteristic, intrinsic traits of the system? How can we extract knowledge from this, from this understanding and use it in a transformative political way? And I think that this is key. At the end of Ballerstein chapter entitled the, the Ideological Tensions of Capitalism, Universalism versus Racism and Sexism, Universalism versus Racism and Sexism, he states that this versus is not actually an opposition, but a sort of dance between universalism and racism and sexism. And I quote, a tense link between the right dosage of humanism and racism and sexism. End of quote. Humanism creates, nurtures, and fosters racism and, ra uh, and sexism, but lets them unleash their fury only to some extent. When racism sexism goes too far, it is resisted, and then these global justice movements are contested, calling out the so-called reverse racism. And if I made the so-called misandry or feminazism. 
So, are the victims of racism, sexism only, go, only going to be ejected from the system at <coughs> acceptable levels? What are the limits of these acceptable levels? What is the accepted dosage of racism, sexism? Uh, before I think Vedran said respectable racism. What are the, where is the threshold of this respectable racism? And acceptable for whom? I believe that we are already witnessing unacceptable levels of violence against women, LGBT people, and racial and racialized people. Unfortunately, the amount the amount of examples that could be inserted here to illustrate my argument would be too large. Capitalism will not tolerate the complete ejection of minorities, women and children. It would only tolerate violence against them. But also, on the other hand, the inherent racism, sexism of liberalism will not allow our complete integration in the system. <coughs> Are we going to be endlessly trapped in this zigzag liberal movement? Can we overcome it from within? I believe that Wallerstein's opinion would be that we cannot. Uh, as he states that our task is to create new systems that do not rely on universalism nor racism, sexism. This task, uh, task evokes Donna Haraway's claim about the need for feminist imagination at work to advance towards the creation of new system, away from sexism, racism, and other forms of oppression. We must use our political imagination to create new worlds that are not dominated by universalism or racism, sexism. Which new systems can we create? How can we construct new worlds without domination? As Wallerstein states, states, the task is not easy. But at least, and I believe that Haraway would, ag would agree in this, it is exciting and a stimulating <laughs> job to do. And as Jules just said before, it may sound utopist, but we may try as well. Thank you. So, and uh, last but not least, Adriana. Uh, thank you, Giorgia, and thank you, Monica, for this really uh, a great introduction to what I will have to say. Um, because we didn't, we didn't really make any kind of deals beforehand, but it seems that the two of us combined spontaneously very nicely. Um, as a matter of fact, my contribution was made while I was listening to you here, and okay, I read some. Not everything, but I was more more or less listening to other people here and also to Manuel's um, a kind of conjunction that we uh, reflect on uh, and discuss together what what was already said in order to have some kind of um, a joint commitment, as Petra would say, uh, some kind of engagement with the book thirty years after, and this is somehow. This is somehow view from without what I will now try to briefly present. I was thinking about the, the title of the book um, very much, maybe even more about the title than about the dialogue between Wollerstein and Bobby Barr, especially because I never read Wollerstein after this book and I did read Bobby Barr and he changed quite a lot from the young Balthusarian into a citizen, citizen subject author of, of, of the now. Um, but what I, uh, what I found interesting and relevant and also strange now was uh, I was reading a um, interview done by Judith Butler with Gail Rubin in 1994, published in The Faces, <coughs> where uh, Gail Rubin says, now we have gender everywhere, gender, race, class, nation, and then there is no gender in this title. So maybe in that sense my, um, my small contribution would be about thinking gender now and 10 years before and 20 years before but in Serbia. So that's maybe what, what Manuela pointed um, to. I will also refer to, to my personal encounter with the book, which happens like 10, 10 years ago or so. Um, the book was uh, stored in the Women's, uh, Women's Studies Library 
uh, in, in a special section which was uh, kind of composed of, of the books that did not belong to feminist theory or gender studies, but to kind of philosophy section, let's say. And um, being myself somewhere between women and philosophy, I was naturally drawn to that, to, to that section, uh, and especially uh, to the book with such a title. Um, now, anyone acquainted with the 80s and 90s um, feminist theory, but I would not say that we have to remain with feminist theory to say this, would know the mantra gender, race, class, where class is always somehow the most ambiguous part, at least in the 80s and the 90s, but also um, ability, nation, what sexuality, of course, and, and other things. Um, nation is sometimes there, sometimes not, but I would say that during the 90s it was very much with us in feminist theory, but also in the first decade of the 2000s. So we, we did focus on gender and nation rather than on gender and race, and especially not on gender and class, if we kind of the kind of uh, scheme and scan that the that feminist theory produced in the last 25 years here. Um, uh, one of the distinctions of the post yugoslav feminism would be the inclusion, almost a necessary one, of nation, as I said, among the constituents of the mantra. Um, the story further goes that seeing then that there is little on gender, women and feminism in the book, my 10 years younger self simply dropped the book and said, okay, I will leave this for later mm -hmm. in my life. Uh, and my notion is that if I had read the chapter written by Wallerstein, the one that, that Monica was also quoting uh, on, on <coughs> universalism versus racism and sexism, uh, that um, the only one which includes something about women in the title, so sexism in the title, I would be very confused by its perspective, which is not the case now. That, and this is something which I want to pinpoint. Uh, that speaks about the discursive context which was dominant in the region and certainly in Serbia, but I would also say in Bosnia, I would also say in Croatia in a way, so Macedonia, Natasha is not, not here now, maybe only Slovenia differs, uh, but also because of its very specific psychoanalytic tradition and, and analysis. Um, I'm referring to a now, again, bargaining framework which brings the class back in, uh, which was almost absolutely missing, not only 10 years ago, but also five years ago. Um, now, uh, not only class, I would also say that um, words like, or terms, notions like capitalism, universalism, accumulation of capital, uh, even meritocracy, in the context of uh, sexism, gender, feminism, were not the words that were really organizing the narrative. Um, in, in the social theory, uh, Avalida is looking at me and not, I, I thank you for that, and also political and social, social science. Uh, that has, however, changed a lot, for better or for worse. What happens is that now we can hear explanations, uh, maybe simple, as Rast Komornik said, or maybe even simplistic in a way, uh, which intersects universalism and, and costs of production or labor force. And I'm referring to two specific places in the text, universalism versus racism and sexism, and I will read them. So where uh, Wallerstein says that universalist ideology is an essential element in the endless pursuit of the accumulation of capital. This is something which we would hear now, it's back again with us. It was not with us at all, not only in feminist theory, and I would insist on that. And it was very problematic to refer to universalism just like that. And the other, and the other uh, quotation that I would want to give uh, um, is somehow, um, I see it as linked to what Yelena Vasilievich was saying um, about the surplus populations. Uh, where Wallerstein says that there that we cannot we cannot have complete ejection of persons 
uh, because, uh, and that's where uh, racism comes in as a magic formula, because to maximize the accumulation of capital, it's necessary to simultaneously not eject people, but to minimize the cost of production and labor power and the cost of political disruption, which is also kind of interestingly put because uh, race was, uh, at least in the 70s, at least in US, uh, a very um, potent um, formula for protests, not of labor force, but of racial identitarian um, populations, so to say. Um, so, what often happens, as it also happened in the chapter that it, in its title has sexism in the 1998, the era of the mantra, gender, race, class, etc., and, and there's this etc., is that women get or are granted less than a paragraph, and this is really what happens in, in this text, because Wollerstein develops the parts of, of his argument on universalism, then develops racism, and then says, Basically, the same thing goes for sexism and then gives one paragraph and not the whole one, as a matter of fact. But he says, where there's sexism, there's also ageism. And then we end up with women being really very partially, and I think this is also generously said, partially um, presented. Um, and, and also, and I think this is the most important thing that I want to say, only in one uh, precise dimension uh, in terms of how are women uh, portrayed as those that are in, in this kind of world system, economic distribution, they are, uh, their position is minimized by, by their work being uh, presented as a non-work. So um, something which is now again very used and, and is very usable in, um, in, the, in the discourses about women or even left feminism. So what I'm interested in especially, knowing bits of Balibar's later work, is how would this topic be elaborated today by the two of them, or maybe uh, how this topic would be elaborated but with, by somebody else, but with uh, all these notions that we have in the title with gender, uh, not by the two of them, they're too old, they do not have to do that, they did many other things, but um, in, in, such, in such a way to, um, in this new universalism, anti-capitalism debate, include also the idea, and I'm again referring to Yelena's uh, contribution, so that we have to, so that we have to, um, see how to put superfluous populations, because we have them now, into, uh, into discussion. How to then understand the return of universalism, but in this new utopian guise, which would want to have all these constituents together, which were not maybe there uh, 20 or 30 years ago, not in this book maybe, uh, how to do that without a generic human, so without the Marxian idea, because we have to preserve something that we've learned from Balibar and uh, his generation of thinkers. I would not want to call them postmodern because this is a swear word here in a way, um, uh, but also uh, from our own lessons, uh, what to do with uh, the 25 years of, of the inexistence of class politics combined with feminist theory and how to now not just erase that and bring back uh, this kind of women are introduced only as non-workers and that is the only thing that is important for us. I don't know whether I'm uh, understandable now at, at the end, but um, what I wanted to say is that I would like us to think how we can use the insights that were with us and how can we also find the absences of some insights that were not here. And I think that I emphasized that with the Serbian and, and the regional case. And now simply do not erase and start something completely anew 
but try to kind of in, intermingle those rather differing insights. That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. So I will first like to invite everybody who has participated thus far to sit at the table and so we can start a discussion and start tying this together. I think it's only Surjan and Yelena that are left and will lead. So in this last panel, before we tie it all together, if that is possible, because this is a <laughs> conceptual chaos. Um, so in the last panel, I think that what we heard <coughs> is a desire, it is a desire on one hand for imagination and the other hand for intersectionality from what I understood. Um, so the question of intersectionality and so how do we do it, what do we do it for us here? But the question is who is us here, not you know like metaphysical or whatever, in, in a sense that what is our framework? What will be our framework if we're going to do intersectionality so that we can tie together what you suggested, right, race, class, gender? Nation. Nation. Universalism. I mean it's open a question, I think. I mean, it's a difficult question, so I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> Well, one kind of provocative point that has not been discussed here is the one by, by Sasha Fatic, and this is the thesis about the divisiveness of Marxist analysis and how we should actually think about reconciliatory perspectives instead. And, um, well, when we think about the region, um, I think Balibars and Wallerstein's analysis is precisely a kind of perspective that challenges the more conventional notions about reflecting on the region. The ones that emphasize antagonisms, ethnonationalism, uh, even the antagonism between core and periphery, taken in the pure economistic sense. Um, and I think that especially this this dimension of Balibars and Wallerstein's analysis, which I call the critical theoretic dimension, is the one which tries to think beyond antagonisms and think about how even the, what is the opposition of capitalism, how even the socialist alternative actually is contaminated by a kind of logic, a kind of, um, a kind of, um, social formation, let's call it that way, a social formation, a mode of subjectivation, which produces a universal form of domination, a domination that transcends class boundaries. That means a domination which is also inscribed in the bourgeois, in the capitalist class, no less than in the proletariat. So this is what we might call a deeper layer of domination than the intersubjective domination, than, than the domination produced by the capitalist mode of production. It's a domination produced by the very process, the process that both thinkers generally term commodification, but which is basically a process of fundamental transformation of the human world um, that is uh, driven by what we have referred to as the violent desire to know. Now, in my opinion, this perspective, this optic of analysis is an optic that does not uh, put antagonisms at the center, it puts the totality at the center. And it is a good starting point for, I think, then in itself, it is not antithetical to those optics which are, let's say, more conventional Marxist analysis or feminist analysis or the analysis of nationalism. On the contrary, it can provide a kind of, I think, grounding for all these perspectives uh, because it is non-reductionist. It does not say, you know, all 
all forms of domination stem from a capitalist relations of production. No, it, it goes beyond that. It says the very forces of production are also part of the problem, you know, industrial production, division of labor is not easily overcome even once we overcome capitalist relations of production. On the other hand, it does not reduce nationalism, sexism, racism to mere ideological layering of capitalism, to mere masking of the real relations. It says no. This is, these are all different dimensions of this mode of subjectivation. And the mode of subjectivation rests on the proliferation of binary oppositions, gender oppositions, ethnic and nationalist oppositions. And they're all co-constitutive. They all kind of complement each other. I think this goes beyond the positing of antagonisms, but it also goes beyond any kind of reconciliatory perspective which simply neglects the antagonisms that are very real, that are in the empirical reality. So this is just a proposition how the book can be very fruitful for, for this region as well. Okay. Who was it? Was it? Okay, okay, I thought there was somebody else before. No, I just wanted to say something very quickly because I, I agree on this point. And um, I was actually, uh, it was a bit strange for me to hear that uh, um, political philosophy is uh, too conflictual, um, as it, uh, in the previous talk, because I come from the tradition of analytic political philosophy, and we usually have the opposite problem. We criticize the mainstream uh, uh, roles in tradition of liberalism to be excessively reconciliatory and not paying not enough attention to conflict, uh, displacing politics, to quote uh, Bonnie Honig, a famous book. And so it was, I guess we should at least uh, uh, conclude uh, that we shouldn't go too far in either direction, neither embracing conflict to the point of praising him uh, and and neither going too much to um, what Rawls called the, first, the fourth role of political philosophy, which is reconciliate us with our society, uh, which he acknowledged carries the risk of doing ideology instead of political philosophy. So just this brief point. <clears throat> Maybe that would be interesting for a discussion. I was, as a translator, I was, I was thinking why we didn't translate this book in any of our languages, because there are books which are translated in mostly all of our languages. <laughs> for example, Foucault, Judith Butler, uh, and how come that we don't have a translation of this one? So I was thinking, so what do you think? Uh, is the fact that the race is the first concept does that contribute to the non-existence of the translation? Because we don't care about race, or we don't care enough about race. Um, we being us here, everywhere. And the other thing is that in the 1998, no, 1988, we were a bit fed up with class which is also one of the concepts in the, in the, in the title of, of this book. What do you think? I mean, why, why there was never any, any attempt to have this book translated? It's not an answer, but what I've noticed that most of us actually um, concentrated on first four Articles in in the so on on racism, universalism, and nationalism. Um, I didn't hear so much, and I was not the first thing that attracted me. Actually, was was the notion the notion of race and the very fact that it was not analyzed and discussed uh, in in our context at all. And it happened to be 
important and actually in also in the roots of, of all problems that that we lived here. So that, that was my first, I was just, you know, it was third, fourth, first, second articles, uh, all, all linked um, primarily to, to the race and then to, to nationalism. So I'm just going to divulge uh, a moment of auto-censorship because when we were writing an article, we had to pose that question, why? And we couldn't, I mean, the only answer we could give, give was speculative answer. And I think that there is something profoundly um, uncomfortable that makes us when we talk about race here. Nationalism is, I mean, nationalism is normal. It became normal thing here because, you know, because there was such a hyperproduction of, of studies, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say critiques, but denunciations. So I would, I would make that distinctions. This distinction, sexism sounds very American, very politically correct, and racism is something that one encounters and one does not know how to engage racism, simply because it's, and I will quote here Derrida, who says it, it is such a elusive and plastic concept that it, well, the idea first that the myth became a concept is, 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 is a modern invention. And so on one hand, we do not have a framework, we do not have language, and we do not have discourse on how to talk about race. Um, and I think that, there, I mean, and I can speak only for myself, there is fear that if I engage this, that I will simply reproduce a racist discourse without necessarily knowing that I'm doing it. So I think this is a tension, and, and this is, I think, the difficulty that we are facing here with race. I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, so I don't know if what others think of this. Just, uh, just a brief comment on this fear also of engaging, uh, talking about racism. Uh, in Spain, we don't address race at all, and we should a lot, but we don't. Uh, <laughs> Um, and yeah, it's curious because in the, the, the chapter that I commented on the most, uh, it talks way more about racism than sexism, but I only talked about sexism. I didn't talk about, almost about racism because I have also this, this tension within me that mm, I, I am not sure, I don't have the framework. I, I don't have the, the language, the framework, I cannot, know how to approach it and I fear being completely wrong. So, so yeah, just I wanted to comment that, that it completely resonated with me. Sorry. Um, I'd like just to point out uh, from a Croatian perspective, um, I believe that um, we had a certain um, when speaking about the dissolution of Yugoslavia and um, the ongoing process of, processes of Europeanization or um, um, ascension to the European Union, it's interesting to see this as a kind of, um, well, the discourse, of, for example, in Croatia was strongly racist, but without using the concept of race, because then you had like this, this division between the Orthodox and the Roman Catholics, and we had this kind of linguistic police of policing uh, the language um, and the attempt to divide, um, which is now present in a different way, in the different context. Uh, for example, when speak about European migration, you have this kind of fear of Arabophobia, which we can, for example, at least in creation uh, case, uh, connect to this fear of proletarization, of falling, uh, falling out this fear of Europe with two gears of a center and a periphery. Um, and in this aspect, for example, I feel that Croatia is, or Croatian society is far more um, permeated by racism, for example, than the center, if we can use these concepts of center and periphery. I would like also to comment just uh, just a bit uh, on Alexander Fatich's idea um, 
if I understand, unfortunately he left, he's not here, uh, uh, about his idea that Balibar moves to kind of Hobbesian notion of conflict, which is absolutely wrong. And uh, Balibar wrote even a book, uh, Violence and Civility, in which, he, in which he moves against the idea of kind of um, making, a, 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 creating a, a natural propensity to conflict. Uh, but I do believe that antagonism, antagonism is crucial to Marxist theory, and it's not something we should like just throw away, because we're throwing baby with the water, as uh, as if. Just a question just came to my mind. Um, we're talking about racism and this, um, how uncomfortable we are and how uncomfortable many people are. I mean, it's called our discussing the race. And I'm just wondering uh, if Balibar and Wallerstein were to write this book again today, uh, what would be the country case or any other uh, case that they would be referring to? For instance, in, in, in this book, uh, they're often referring to South Africa as if it's a sort of a scandal. For, you can you can almost sense it like it's something very, it's a scandal as that in the 80s we're talking about now. But I, so what would they be talking? What would they be referring to if they were to write this? Would they be maybe referring to um, United States of America or today where the racial um, uh, with, the, <clears throat> with the racial conflicts reach their hold during the presidency of black uh, or African American president, would that be the case? Would that be like uh, Franz Fanon's phrase, black high pl high faces? Uh, how what is it? Black faces on high places. Right? What would be the scandal of today that, that would inspire them? I'm just curious. What do you think about that? <laughs> this was just also. A <laughs> a motivation just to mention um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina the result of the national of our nationalisms and and conflicts that we um, had and that we still still have in this um, war peace time it's the uh, it's the for instance the example of the schools elementary schools um, and even pre-care uh, institutions that we have uh, children uh, uh, two schools under uh, under one roof and um, now it's it's the result of nationalism but more and more in the public discourse we hear um, for these cases, especially, for instance, children from Yaitse, they are fighting against the system because they are divided in, in different schools and uh, they have different programs and they want to be together. And they call this system in Bosnia and Herzegovina apartheid. And they are now using in their public speeches and when they are explaining, they, they, they use apartheid and they use even even racism so it's not it's not only the product of i think that this is a good example that that this problem is radicalizing and becoming something that we could call because this segregation is not um, the roots of this segregation are really problematic and um, and really i don't know bothering all of us you know wanting to 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 live normally so i think that maybe sometimes it's, it's good to radicalize in order to put the, the light on this problem and in order to to maybe have the opportunity to resolve it so i would maybe no not for balibar but i would maybe take these examples of children that are segregated in our schools as um, as a one of example that we cannot only talk about nationalism and these things okay Um, regarding this uh, question of, uh, of apartheid, for example, in Bosnia Herzegovina, I believe one question which would be pertinent is if uh, race relation is a relation of domination, then who is the dominant side? And um, it seems to me that, for example, uh, in, in Croatia, uh, what has happened is that we have um, 
a society permeated by racist practices without necessarily being enunciated in a discourse, although not necessarily true. And on the other hand, for example, it seems to me that there is a certain process of self-racialization or, you know, if you, um, if you ethnicize the politics, uh, then you will necessarily get the reverse politics. You will uh, you have um, political ethnicities. So, for example, when you have a, a politi political debates in Croatia between uh, proponents of uh, the left or right, Mr. Partisan, you have this kind of self-racialization. There is no uh, really a desire to overcome, or if there is any possibility to overcome this kind of duality. But you have this kind of um, a kind of genealogical uh, uh, division, uh, which uh, I believe, once again, we need to somehow relate back to the problem of economy and capitalism as such, and the uh, dissolution of socialism and introduction of capitalist relations, uh, because this is also what the book is about, and uh, it seems that the work to do is to be done still, so it is up. Gunnar's first intervention actually inspired me that um, I would say that um, the absence of the racial uh, question uh, was uh, the result of provincialization of our, our space. Um, in, uh, he was speaking from uh, a Croatian perspective, I'm now speaking from Slovenian. In Slovenia, racism is um, regulated, is present in the very constitution. The constitution recognizes Italian and Hungarian minority and makes a difference of national minority to the ethnic group who are Roma. Roma have a lower status according to the constitution while the most numerous groups like um, Bosnians, uh, Croatians, Serbians, Macedonians and Albanians don't have any legal grounds for, for their reproduction. So uh, <laughs> when you look at it, it it's racist. Um, uh, now, I think that uh, my impression uh, in the late 80s and uh, early 90s was that it was about racism, not nationalism, uh, because in Slovenia the great question, and I guess in Croatia too, was we are not Balkanians, that's not the Balkans. And it applied collectively to everything south of the, uh, of the, of, of the border, of Kupa, for Slovenia, or of, well, <laughs> east of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, Drava for you. So, uh, it was racism. But then, you know, wise, wise people from the, from the dominant academic traditions or institutions came and tell, told us this is nationalism. So, we all kind of naively said, okay, this is nationalism. But it was worse. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, it, it was this instant pro, uh, provincialization, loss of uh, institutional prestige, uh, uh, huge import of, uh, of let's say, um, mainstream uh, wisdom, school wisdom, uh, that kind of blocked uh, real, uh, real reflection about that. <clears throat> So it seems to me that what we are struggling here when we talk about race is the question of how do we identify racist complex and where do we find it? I mean, because Balibar talks about the complex. For him, it, it's not a relation, it is not process. 
it is not elusive, it is a complex. So it, it has a beginning and the end, it has a structure, it has boundaries. So I'm just not sure how to think racist complex, if that would be you know, the task of a thought, how to think it in, in, in the region. This will not be an answer or anything, but I was just uh, provoked to think about it because it was just what Professor Mochnik said that uh, he referred to a distinction between nationalism and racism. So it turns out from what he said that Slovenes were racist and he, we here were just nationalists, even though we did <laughs> worse atrocities. That's the problem with racism and nationalism. Like it was worse. He said it was worse. It was not nationalism with racism. It was worse. So that's the problem with Mbali Bar writes about it, like with the, the, this double game with nationalism, it can be both good and bad, and that's the problem. With racism, we know it's bad, so that's how we define it. It's bad nationalism, uh, well, we can discuss it. And that's the problem with defining uh, the, the, the complex of, of, of racism. Like. So is it really just a matter of degrees? Is it just like nationalism goes up, and then when nationalism becomes evil, it turns somehow magically into racism? Are they two different phenomena or not? Or is it really, I mean, it's, it's true what Bolivar says, that they, are, they function together, that somehow uh, nationalism is not just not universal enough, and then racism steps in and universalizes it, or it works the other way around, where the nationalism is too universal, racism helps it, be more particular. So that's true, but it's too abstract what he says. It doesn't really help us to identify racism because with nationalism it's easy to talk about. It's easy to be a scholar of nationalism. It's much more difficult to be a scholar of racism, especially because we would say that uh, races as such do not exist. Nations exist as constructs. They have their effects. But that's also that's the elusive nature of racism. I think that's the, the key thing is how to conceptualize the relation between uh, nationalism and racism. And if nation is that real category of the ideology of nationalism, what is the real category of racism? We will all agree that racism don't exist, but what is the category of races do exist, racist politics do exist, races don't exist. That's the problem. Nations do exist. Now, even if they're imaginary, they're imagined communities, but they do exist and they have bound, they exist, they, 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 they're legal entities. They're material. Yeah. Perhaps the answer is to not regard racism simply as a discourse, but as a practice. So, for example, when we, <coughs> the case of constitution in Slovenia and the Croatia, of course, also, it's a discursive practice. For example, in Croatia, a uh, Serb minority was like eliminated mm. from the constitution. My hometown split a uh, Serb, uh, Serb, Serbian minority or people from mixed marriages were eliminated physically uh, from the very space of the city, from their apartments, from their houses. So perhaps this is um, a practice or a, a practice of creating a minority which as if um, has this kind of uh, historical lineage, which, which cannot be um, ab uh, absorbed in a national community and must be expelled even in, in, in practice in, from space or from legal documents. I'm not sure if that is the answer. But. What, what do you think if, if we introduce, as you introduce, different kinds of concepts of nation, so if, if these two were present in, throughout the book, would that impact somehow on the notion of race and racism and also class? So would there be an Eastern version of racism and race? And is this talk of racism that we endured during the 1900s, 2000s, a reflection, I mean, or, or is no, just. I Uh, earlier, I don't believe that that is something which we can project 
uh, on the question of caste. I think that is what I try to emphasize, that, that is two instinctive uh, political uh, traditions in the concept of nationalism and what nationalism is capable of product uh, as national state. <coughs> so I don't believe that we can make, or at least I didn't think about it, uh, can we make some kind of a parallel with Brexit. I believe that it's quite focalized on the, on the question of national, national state and nationalism. <coughs> maybe there is a, maybe we can make a parallel, but that, is, that wasn't something which I was, which I actually think about. So we have to have one more question and then we have a question. It's just a comment. You asked where do we identify the racist complex today and how do we delineate from nationalism? It's a very tricky question, especially when we take into account that today we are dealing with what Willie Barton Wallerstein called neo racism or differentialist racism, which does not. Uh, Bali Bar's argument. Uh, about racism as a supplement of nationalism seems to draw on kind of more traditional kind of racism, racism which functions as a pseudo-scientific discourse, <coughs> racism which tries to uh, base itself on anthropological universals and, and kind of a universal knowledge of you know, some kind of uh, invariance of the human condition. And in such, and there you can easily delineate it from nationalism. But in with differentialist racism, it becomes more more, more complicated. Uh, at one point, Balibar I think mentions in the book that well, what we might witness in the future with the further uh, progress of science, of psychology, cognitive science, and and, and, and medicine, is that racist. Uh, even differentialist racism will be replaced by a more individualized kinds of uh, hierarchization. He mentions this battery of sciences measuring the IQ, measuring individual capabilities, individual potentialities. And it seems to me that this is something that, that has not only survived, but is actually flourishing and this is this is the guise that the traditional racism the scientific pseudo-scientific racism has taken today and as as a you know it's a further dimension of the desire to know compared to and it's a further supplement of both nationalism and differentialist racism and this i think is where the racist complex is kind of uh, closed, is, 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 is um, rounded. Uh, so you have a nationalist dimension, the dimension of homogenizing populations, <coughs> further standardization. You have that differential racism, which allows for racialization of parts of the labor force. or um, And then you have the third dimension, which let's call it let's call it some kind of a panopticon, in Freudian terms, where you have a neo-racism of an anthropological universalist kind, which now no more relates to races, but relates to individuals, which tries to hierarchize, structure, uh, map, and, and, and construct, actually, a, a highly individualized population in, in today's capitalism. Say. Uh, and this is, these are the three dimensions of, of uh, the racist complex. Thank you. So I think that we need to close um, this, um, this seminar. And so I think that I um, will end not with solutions because I don't think that we thought them through, but I want to think with a brief summary of what we discussed. I think that one of the problems that we have with this book is that it gave us a general diagnosis and that we need to figure out ways how to translate that diagnosis to this context and what Adriana was talking about to find intersections between the concepts. And yet, we seem to have a conceptual quarrel. 
in a sense that we think concepts differently and what they mean and w what they refer to. So I never thought I would say this, but there seems to be a necessity of some kind of order. Um, I think that we have a s next question is, again, the question of human being, recognition, and subject. Uh, and it seems to me that, um, and desire. Uh, so th this is one of the aspects that also Balibar was suggesting in his analysis. Also, he, he doesn't use psychoanalysis, but I think that we heard in the reception of the problem of subject. So the question is, can we think subject away from and you know, invest subject with some other kind of desire. I mean, why not? I don't think that we have at this point anything to lose anymore. And I think that Yelena was talking about the impasse and the paralysis that we're in is the question of emancipatory politics and what would we mean to bring together um, all of these concepts and think them through and then destroy them. I think this is one of the the, one of the the proposals that that Balibar does that that we have a, uh, we have a double movement of construction of co concepts and yet their destruction it's just that we have to decide which ones to destroy and which ones to keep rethinking with new meanings and new um, new uh, thoughts so thank you all for for coming thank you all for participating it was a great pleasure thank you professor Bergio for this wonderful opportunity we hope we'll see you soon, and uh, tomorrow we'll see you. I'm sorry. Tomorrow we'll see you at the at the lecture, so we can keep discussing this. Thank you. Thank you.